The Adventures of Sir Gareth by Beatrice Clay Gareth was the youngest of the sons of Lot and Bellicent, and had grown up long after Gawain and Mordred left their home for King Arthur's court, so that when he came before the king, all humbly attired, he was known not even by his own brothers. King Arthur was keeping Pentecost at Kink Canadon on the Welsh border, and, as his custom was, waited to begin the feast until some adventure should befall. Presently there was seen approaching a youth, who, to the wonderment of all that saw, leaned upon the shoulders of two men, his companions, and yet, as he passed up the hall, he seemed a goodly youth, tall and broad-shouldered. When he stood before the king, suddenly he drew himself up, and after due greeting said, "'Sir King, I would ask of you three boons, one to be granted now, and two hereafter when I shall require them.' And Arthur, looking upon him, was pleased, for his countenance was open and honest. So he made answer, "'Fair son, ask of me aught that is honourable, and I will grant it.' Then the youth said, "'For this present I ask only that ye will give me meat and drink for a year and a day.' "'Ye might have asked and had a better gift,' replied the king. "'Tell me now your name.' "'At this time I may not tell it,' said the youth." Now King Arthur trusted every man until he proved himself unworthy, and in this youth he thought he saw one who should do nobly and win renown. So, laughing, he bade him keep his own counsel since so he would, and gave him in charge to Sir Kay the Sensual. Now Sir Kay was but harsh to those whom he liked not, and from the first he scorned the young man. "'For none,' said he, "'but a low-born lout would crave meat and drink when he might have asked for a horse and arms.' But Sir Lancelot and Sir Gawain took the youth's part. Neither knew him for Gareth of Orkney's, but both believed him to be a youth of good promise who, for his own reasons, would pass in disguise for a season. So Gareth lived the year among the kitchen boys, all the time mocked and scorned by Sir Kay, who called him Fair Hands, because his hands were white and shapely. But Lancelot and Gawain showed him all courtesy, and failed not to observe how in all trials of strength he excelled his comrades, and that he was ever present to witness the feats of the knights in the tournaments. So the year passed, and again King Arthur was keeping the feast of Pentecost with his knights, when a damsel entered the hall and asked his aid. "'For,' said she, "'my sister is closely besieged in her castle by a strong knight who lays waste all her lands.' And since I know that the knights of your court be the most renowned in the world, I have come to crave help of your mightiest. "'What is your sister's name, and who is he that oppresses her?' asked the king. "'The Red Knight he is called,' replied the damsel. "'As for my sister, I will not say her name, only that she is a high-born lady and owns broad lands.' Then the king frowned and said, "'Ye would have aid, but will say no name. I may not ask knight of mine to go on such an errand.' Then forth stepped Gareth from among the serving-men at the hall-end, and said, "'Sir King, I have eaten of your meat in your kitchen this twelve months since, and now I crave my other two boons.' "'Ask and have,' replied the King. "'Grant me then this adventure of this damsel, and bid Sir Lancelot to ride after me to knight me at my desire, for of him alone would I be made knight.' "'It shall be so,' answered the King. "'What?' cried the damsel. I ask for a knight, and ye give me a kitchen boy. Shame on you, Sir King! And in great wrath she fled from the hall, mounted her palfrey, and rode away. Gareth but waited to array himself in the armour which he had kept ever in readiness for the time when he should need it, and mounting his horse, rode after the damsel. But when Sir Kay knew what had happened, he was wroth, and got to horse to ride after Gareth and bring him back. Even as Gareth overtook the damsel, so did Kay come up with him, and cried, "'Turn back, fair hands! What, sir, do ye not know me?' "'Yes,' answered Gareth. "'I know you for the most discourteous knight in Arthur's court.' Then Sir Kay rode upon him with his lance, but Gareth turned it aside with his sword, and pierced Sir Kay through the side, so that he fell to the ground and lay there without motion. Sir Gareth took Sir Kay's shield and spear, and was about to ride away, when seeing Sir Lancelot draw near, he called upon him to joust. At the first encounter Sir Lancelot unhorsed Gareth, but quickly helped him to his feet. Then, at Gareth's desire, they fought together with swords, and Gareth did knightly till at length, Sir Lancelot said laughing, "'Why should we fight any longer? Of a truth, ye are a stout knight.' "'If that is indeed your thought, I pray you make me knight,' cried Gareth. So Sir Lancelot knighted Gareth, 
who, bidding him farewell, hastened after the damsel, for she had ridden on again while the two knights talked. When she saw him coming, she cried, "'Keep off! Ye smell of the kitchen!' "'Damsel,' said Sir Gareth, "'I must follow until I have fulfilled my adventure.' "'Till ye accomplish the adventure, Turnspit? "'Your part in it shall soon be ended.' "'I can only do my best,' answered Sir Gareth. "'Now as they rode through the forest, "'they met with a knight sore beset by six thieves, "'and him Sir Gareth rescued. "'The knight then bade Gareth and the damsel rest at his castle, "'and entertained them right gladly until the morn, "'when the two rode forth again. "'Presently they drew near to a deep river "'where two knights kept the ford. "'How now, kitchen knave? "'Will ye fight or escape while ye may?' "'cried the damsel. "'I would fight though there were six instead of two, "'replied Sir Gareth. "'Therewith he encountered the one knight in midstream "'and struck him such a blow on the head "'that he fell stunned into the water and was drowned. "'Then, gaining the land, "'Gareth cleft in two both helmet and head of the other knight "'and turned to the damsel, saying, "'Lead on.' I follow. But the damsel mocked him, saying, "'What a mischance is this, that a kitchen-boy should slay two noble knights! Be not over-proud, Turnspit. It was but luck, if indeed you did not attack one knight from behind.' "'Say what you will. I will follow,' said Sir Gareth. So they rode on again, the damsel in front and Sir Gareth behind, till they reached a wide meadow where stood many fair pavilions, and one, the largest, was all of blue, and the men who stood about it were clothed in blue, and bore shields and spears of that colour, and of blue, too, were the trappings of the horses. Then said the damsel, Yonder is the blue knight, the goodliest that ever ye have looked upon, and five hundred knights own him lord. I will encounter him, said Sir Gareth, for if he be a good knight, and true as ye say, he will scarce set on me with all his following, and man to man I fear him not. Fie! said the damsel, for a dirty knave ye brag loud, and even if you overcome him, his might is as nothing to that of the red knight who besieges my lady sister. So get ye gone while ye may. Damsel, said Sir Gareth, ye are but ungentle so to rebuke me, for, knight or knave, I have done you good service, nor will I leave this quest while life is mine. Then the damsel was ashamed, and looking curiously at Gareth, she said, I would gladly know what manner of man ye are, for I heard you call yourself kitchen knave before Arthur's self, but ye have ever answered patiently, though I have chided you shamefully, and courtesy comes only of gentle blood. Thereat Sir Gareth but laughed, and said, He is no knight whom a maiden can anger by harsh words. So talking they entered the field, and there came to Sir Gareth a messenger from the blue knight, to ask him if he came in peace or in war. As your lord pleases, said Sir Gareth. So when the messenger had brought back this word, the blue knight mounted his horse, took his spear in his hand, and rode upon Sir Gareth. At their first encounter their lances shivered to pieces, and such was the shock that their horses fell dead. So they rushed on each other with sword and shield, cutting and slashing till the armor was hacked from their bodies. But at last Sir Gareth smote the blue knight to the earth. Then the blue knight yielded, and at the damsel's entreaty Sir Gareth spared his life. So they were reconciled, and at the request of the blue knight, Sir Gareth and the damsel abode that night in his tents. As they sat at table, the blue knight said, "'Fad damsel, are ye not called Lynette?' "'Yes,' answered she, "'and I am taking this noble knight to the relief of my sister, the Lady Lyons.' "'God speed you, sir,' said the blue knight, "'for he is a stout knight whom ye must meet. Long ago might he have taken the lady, but that he hoped that Sir Lancelot, or some other of Arthur's most famous knights, coming to her rescue, might fall beneath his lance. If ye overthrow him, then ye are the peer of Sir Lancelot and Sir Tristram. Sir Knight, answered Gareth, I can but strive to bear me worthily as one whom the great Sir Lancelot made knight. So in the morning they bade farewell to the blue knight, who vowed to carry to King Arthur word of all that Gareth had achieved, and they rode on, till in the evening they came to a little ruined hermitage, where there awaited them a dwarf, sent by the Lady Lyons, with all manner of meats and other store. In the morning the dwarf set out again to bear word to his lady that her rescuer was come. As he drew near the castle the red knight stopped him, demanding whence he came. "'Sir,' said the dwarf, "'I have been with my lady's sister, who brings with her a knight to the rescue of my lady.' "'It is a lost labour, said the Red Knight. "'Even though she brought Lancelot or Tristram, I hold myself a match for them.' "'He is none of these,' said the dwarf. "'But he has overthrown the knights who kept the ford, and the blue knight yielded to him.' "'Let him come,' said the Red Knight. "'I shall soon make an end of him, and a shameful death shall he have at my hands, as many a better knight has had.' 
So saying, he let the dwarf go. Presently there came riding towards the castle Sir Gareth and the damsel Lynette, and Gareth marvelled to see hang from the trees some forty knights in goodly armour, their shields reversed beside them, and when he inquired of the damsel she told him how these were the bodies of brave knights, who, coming to the rescue of Lady Lyons, had been overthrown and shamefully done to death by the red knight. Then was Gareth shamed and angry, and he vowed to make an end of these evil practices. So at last they drew near to the castle walls, and saw how the plain around was covered with the red knight's tents, and the noise was that of a great army. Hard by was a tall sycamore tree, and from it hung a mighty horn made of an elephant's tusk. Spurring his horse, Gareth rode to it and blew such a blast that those on the castle walls heard it. The knight came forth from their tents to see who blew so bold a blast, and from a window of the castle the Lady Lyons looked forth and waved her hand to her champion. Then, as Sir Gareth made his reverence to the lady, the Red Knight called roughly to him to leave his courtesy and look to himself. For, said he, she is mine, and to have her I have fought many a battle. It is but vain labour, said Sir Gareth, since she loves you not. Know too, Sir Knight, that I have vowed to rescue her from you. So did many another who now hangs on a tree, replied the Red Knight, and soon ye shall hang beside them. Then both laid their spears in rest and spurred their horses. At the first encounter each smote the other full in the shield, and the girths of the saddles bursting they were borne to the earth, where they lay for a while as if dead. But presently they rose, and setting their shields before them, rushed upon each other with their swords, cutting and hacking till the armour lay on the ground in fragments. So they fought till noon, and then rested, but soon renewed the battle, and so furiously they fought that often they fell to the ground together. Then when the bells sounded for evensong the knights rested again a while unlacing their helms to breathe the evening air. But looking up to the castle windows, Gareth saw the Lady Lyons gazing earnestly upon him. Then he caught up his helm, and calling to the Red Knight bade him make ready for battle. "'And this time,' said he, "'we will make an end of it.' "'So be it,' said the Red Knight. Then the Red Knight smote Gareth on the hand that his sword flew from his grasp, and with another blow he brought him groveling to the earth. At the sight of this Lynette cried aloud, and hearing her, Gareth, with a mighty effort, threw off the Red Knight, leaped to his sword, and got it again within his hand. Then he pressed the Red Knight harder than ever, and at last bore him to the earth, and unlacing his helm, made ready to slay him. But the Red Knight cried aloud, "'Mercy! I, I yield!' At first, remembering the evil deaths of the forty good knights, Gareth was unwilling to spare him. But the Red Knight besought him to have mercy, telling him how, against his will, he had been bound by a vow to make war on Arthur's knights. So Sir Gareth relented, and bade him set forth at once for King Kenadon, and entreat the king's pardon for his evil past. And this the Red Knight promised to do. Then, amidst much rejoicing, Sir Gareth was borne into the castle. There his wounds were dressed by the Lady Lyons, and there he rested until he recovered his strength. And having won her love, when Gareth returned to Arthur's court, the Lady Lyons rode with him, and they too were wed with great pomp in the presence of the whole fellowship of the round table, the king rejoicing much that his nephew had done so valiantly. So Sir Gareth lived happily with Dame Lyons, winning fame and the love of all true knights. As for Lynette, she came again to Arthur's court and wedded Sir Gareth's younger brother, Sir Gaheris. End of The Adventures of Sir Gareth by Beatrice Clay The Beginning, edited by Mara Louise Pratt in the beginning, when the beautiful and sunny world was first made, there stood in the very midst of all its beauty Mount Ida, a mountain so high, so far away up among the snowy clouds, that its summit was lost in the shining light of the rays of the sun. At its base, stretching away to the north, the south, the east, and the west, as far as even the eyes of the gods could reach, lay the soft green valleys and the great broad plain beyond encircling the whole great plain and curling lovingly around it in all the little bends and bays of the distant shore, lay the deep blue waters, and beyond the waters, hidden in the distant mists, rose the great mountains in which the frost giants dwelt. On the top of Mount Ida the gods had built their shining city Asgard, and from its golden gateway to the valley below was stretched the richly colored Rainbow Bridge, with its wonderful bars of red and yellow and blue, orange and green, indigo and purple, and in this shining city where the gods dwelt there was no sorrow, no grief, no pain of any kind, 
Never was the sun's light shut off by heavy clouds, never did the cruel lightnings flash, nor came their blights upon the harvest fields. Never did the heavy rains fall, nor did the cold wind sweep down upon this shining city. But alas, there came a time when a shadow fell upon this city that shone so like a golden cloud resting upon the mountain peak. For the fates, the three cruel sisters, came and took up their abode at the foot of the wonderful tree of life, whose roots were in the earth and whose branches, reaching high above the shining city, protected it from the sun's fierce heat and strong white light. And from that time even the gods themselves were no longer free from care and sorrow. Envy sprang up among the children of the great god Odin, sickness and even death fell upon them, and the frost giants waged war with them. A war that would never cease in all the ages that were to come, until that day when the sun's light went out forever and the dark reign of Ragnarok fell upon the earth. It was a beautiful earth that lay stretched out at the foot of Mount Ida. The fields were rich with grain, the trees were loaded with fruits, the sun shone warm and bright, but there were no harvesters, no gatherers of the fruit, no children to run and frolic in the sunshine. The fair earth is desolate, said Odin to himself as he looked down from his golden temple. There should be people there, not gods and goddesses like us here upon Mount Ida, but beings less powerful than we, beings who can love and enjoy and whose children shall fill the earth with their happy voices, and the care of all these beings shall be mine. As he spoke, he, the old father, passed down the rainbow bridge out into the rich green valley below. As he passed on beneath the trees, he saw, standing together, their branches bending towards each other, a straight, strong ash and a gentle, graceful elm. From these trees, said Odin to himself, will I create the earth people, the man I will name Ask and the woman Embla. It is a beautiful, sunny world, they should be very happy in it. How their children shall delight in the broad fields and the sunny slopes, and no harm shall come to them, for I, the All Father, will watch over them in all the ages to come. End of the beginning, a Norse folktale, read by Just Seth. The Coming of Lu, a Celtic wonder tale, retold by Ella Young. Mananan Maclear, who rules the ocean, took the little sun god Luch in his arms and held him up so he could see the whole of Ireland with the waves whispering about it everywhere. Say farewell to the mountains and rivers and the big trees and the flowers and the grass, O oh, Lu, for you are coming away with me. The child stretched out his hands and cried, Goodbye, mountains and flowers and rivers. Some day I will come back to you. Then Mananan wrapped Luch in his cloak and stepped on to his boat, the ocean sweeper. And without oar or sail, they journeyed over the sea till they crossed the waters at the edge of the world and came to the country of Mananan. A beautiful country, shining with the colours of the dawn. Lu stayed in that country with Mananan. He raced the waves along the strand. He gathered apples sweeter than the honey from trees with crimson blossoms. And wonderful birds came to play with him. Mananan's daughter Niav took him through woods where there were milk-white deer with horns of gold and black-maned lions with spotted panthers and unicorns that shone like silver, and strange beasts that no one ever heard of. And all the animals were glad to see him, and he played with them, and called them by their names. Every day he grew taller, and stronger, and more beautiful. But he did not any day ask Mananan to take him back to Ireland. Every night, when darkness had come into the sky, Mananan wrapped himself in his mantle of power and crossed the sea and walked all round Ireland, stepping from rock to rock. No one saw him because his mantle made him invisible, but he saw everything and knew that trouble had found the dead Inanans. 
the ugly, misshapen folk of the Fomor, had come into Ireland and spread themselves over the country like a pestilence. They had stolen the cauldron of plenty and carried it away to their own land, where Balor of the evil eye reigned. They had taken the spear of victory also. And the only one of the four great jewels of sovereignty remaining to the dead Inanans was the Stone of Destiny. It was hidden deep in the earth of Ireland, and because of it the Fomorians could not altogether conquer the country, nor could they destroy the dead Inanans. Though they drove them from their pleasant palaces and hunted them through the glens and valleys like outlaws. Mananan himself had the fourth jewel, the Sword of Light. He kept it and waited. When Luch was full grown, Mananan said to him, It is three times seven years as mortals count time since I brought you to Tirnanog, and in that time I have never given you a gift. Today I will give you a gift. He brought out the Sword of Light and gave it to Luch. And when Luch took it in his hands, he remembered how he had cried to the hills and rivers of Ireland. Some day I will come back to you. And he said to Mananan, I want to go back to Ireland. You will not find joyousness there, O Luch, or the music of harp strings, or feasting. The dead Nanans are shorn of their strength, Ogmai, their champion, carries logs to warm Fomorian hearths. Angus wanders like an outcast. And Nuada, the king, has but one done where those who had once the lordship of the world meet in secret like hunted folk. I have a good sword, said Luke. I will go to my kinsfolk. Oh, Luch, said Mananan, they have never known you. Will you leave me and Niamh and this land where sorrow has never touched you for the sake of stranger kinsfolk? Luch answered, I remember the hills and the woods and the rivers of Ireland. And though all my kinsfolk were gone from it, and the sea covered everything but the tops of the mountains, I would go back. You have the hardiness that wins victory, said Mananan. I will set you on my own white horse and give you companions as high-hearted as yourself. I will put my helmet on your head and my breastplate over your heart, You shall drive the Fomorians out of Ireland as chaff is driven by the wind. When Luch put on the helmet of Mananan, brightness shot into the sky, as if a new sun had risen. When he put on the breastplate, a great wave of music swelled and sounded through Tirnanog. When he mounted the white horse, A mighty wind swept past him, and lo, the companions Mananan had promised rode beside him. The horses were white like his, and gladness that age cannot weather shone in their faces. When they came to the sea that is about Tirnanog, the little crystal waves lifted themselves up to look at Luch, And when he and his comrades sped over the sea as lightly as blown foam, the little waves followed them till they came to Ireland, and the three great waves of Ireland thundered a welcome, the wave of Thoth, the wave of Ruri, and the long, snow-white, foaming wave of Kleena. No one saw the fairy host coming into Ireland, At the place where their horses leapt from the sea to land, there was a great wood of pine trees. Let us go into the woods, said Luch, and they rode between the tall, straight tree trunks into the silent heart of the wood. 
Rest here, said Lou, till morning. I will go to the dun of Nuada and get news of my kinsfolk. He put his shining armor from him and wrapped himself in a dark cloak and went on foot to the dun of Nuada. He struck the brazen door and the guardian of the door spoke to him from within. What do you seek? My way into the dun. No one enters here who has not his craft. What can you do? I have the craft of a carpenter. We have a carpenter within. He is Luchte, son of Luchade. I have the craft of a smith. We have a smith within. Call him of the three new ways of working. I have the craft of a champion. We have a champion within. He is Ogmai himself. I have the craft of a harper. We have a harper within. Even Afghan. Son of Bicklemus. The men of the three gods choose him in the fairy hills. I have the craft of a poet and historian. We have a poet and historian within, even in, son of Ethaman. I have the craft of a wizard. We have many wizards and magicians within. I have the craft of a physician. We have a physician within, even Dian Kecht. I have the craft of a cupbearer. We have nine cupbearers within. I have the craft of a brazier. We have a brazier within, even Crednikerd. Go hence and ask your king if he has within any one man who can do all these things. If he has, I will not seek to enter. The guardian of the door hurried into Nuada. O king, he said, the most wonderful youth in the world is waiting outside your door tonight. He seeks admittance as the Ildana, the master of every craft. Let him come in, said King Nuada. Luke came into the dun. Ogmai, the champion, took a good look at him. He thought him young and slender and was minded to test him. There was a great stone before the seat of the king. It was flat and round, and fourscore yoke of oxen could not move it. Ogmai stooped and lifted the stone. He cast it through the door so that it crossed the fosse, which was round the dun. That was his challenge to the Eldana. It is a good champion cast, said Lou. I will better it. He went outside, lifted the stone and cast it back, not through the door, but through the strong wall of the dun so that it fell in the place where it had lain before Ogmai lifted it. Your work cast is better than mine, said Ogmai. Sit in the seat of the champion with your face to the king. Luch drew his hand over the wall. It became whole as before. He sat in the champion's seat. Let chess be brought, said the king. They played, and Lou won all the games, so that thereafter it was passed into a proverb to make the crow of Lou. Truly you are the Ildana, said Nuada. I would fain hear music of your making, but I have no harp to offer you. I see a kingly harp within reach of your hand, said Luv. That is the harp of the doctor. No one can bring music from that harp but himself. When he plays it on the four seasons, spring, 
summer, autumn, and winter pass over the earth. I will play on it, said Luch. The harp was given to him. Luch played the music of Joey, and outside the dun the birds began to sing as though it were morning, and wonderful crimson flowers sprang through the grass, flowers that trembled with delight and swayed and touched each other with a delicate fairy ring and as of silver bells. Inside the dun a subtle sweetness of laughter filled the hearts of everyone. It seemed to them that they had never known gladness till that night. Luch played the music of sorrow. The wind moaned outside. Where the grass and flowers had been, there was a dark sea of moving waters. The dead Ananans within the dun bowed their heads on their hands and wept as they had never wept for any sorrow. Lou played the music of peace, and outside there felt silently a strange snow. Flake by flake, it settled on the earth and changed to starry dew. Flake by flake, the quiet of the land of the silver fleece settled in the hearts and minds of Nuada and his people. They closed their eyes and slept, each in his seat. Luch put the harp from him and stole out of the dun. The snow was still falling outside. It settled on his dark cloak and shone like silver scales. It settled on the thick curls of his hair and shone like jeweled fire. It filled the night about him with white radiance. He went back to his companions. The sun had risen in the sky when the dead Inanans woke in Nuada's dun. They were light-hearted and joyous, and it seemed to them that they had dreamed overnight a strange, beautiful dream. The Fomorians have not taken the sun out of the sky, said Nuada. Let us go to the hill of Usna and send to our scattered comrades that we may make a stand against our enemies. They took up their weapons and went to the hill of Usna, and they were not long upon it when a band of Fomorian devastators came on them. The Fomorians scoffed among themselves when they saw how few the dead Inanans were and how ill-prepared for fighting. Behold, they cried, what mighty kings are today upon Usna, the hill of sovereignty? Come down, O kings, and bow yourselves before your masters. We will not bow ourselves before you, said Nuada, for ye are ugly and vile, and lords neither of us nor of Ireland. With hoarse cries the Fomorians fell on the dead Inanans, but Nuada and his folk held together and withstood them as well as they were able. Scarcely had the weapons clashed when a light appeared in the horizon and a sound of mighty battle trumpets shook the air. The light was so white that no one could look at it and great rose-red streamers shot from it into the sky. It is a second sunrise, said the Fomorians. It is the deliverer, said the dead Inanans. Out of the light came the glorious company of warriors from Tirnanog. Luch was leading them. He had the helmet of Mananan on his head, the breastplate of Mananan over his heart, and the great white horse of Mananan beneath him. The sword of light was bare in his hands. He fell on the Fomorians as a sea eagle falls on her prey, as lightning flashes out of the clear sky. Before him and his companions, they were destroyed as stubble is destroyed by fire. He held his hand when only nine of them remained alive. Bow yourselves, he said, before the king Nuada and before the dead Nanans, 
for they are your lords, and the lords of Ireland. And go hence to Balor of the evil eye, and tell him and his misshapen brood, that the dead Inanans have taken their own again, and they will wage war against the Fomorians, till there is not one left to darken the earth with his shadow. The nine Fomorians bowed themselves before the king, Nuara, and before the dead Inanans, and before Luch Lavauda, the Ildana, and they arose and carried his message to Balor of the Evil Eye, king of the Fomorians. End of the Coming of Lu, a Celtic Wonder Tale by Ella Young How the Kangaroo Got a Long Tail and the Wombat a Flat Forehead by W. E. Thomas Many years ago, Murm the Kangaroo and Warring the Wombat were both men. They were very friendly and hunted and lived together in the same camping ground. Warring had a very comfortable gunya made of bark and soft leaves, but Murm, who was a careless fellow, did not trouble to build a home. He was content to sleep in the open, by the side of a big fire, with the blue sky for a cover and the green grass for a couch. This open-air life was very nice in the fine weather, when the stars twinkled in the sky like golden fireflies, but it was extremely uncomfortable in the rainy season. One night a great storm arose. The wind howled eerily and rocked the tall trees to and fro as though they were shaken by the strong arms of an invisible giant. The rain fell in torrents, and darkness covered the light of the stars. The rain quickly quenched the glowing embers of Murm's fire, and he was left to the mercy of the storm. After shivering in the cold for some time, he decided to seek the hospitality of Warreen. Surely my friend would not refuse me shelter on such a night as this, he thought. I will ask him. Feeling very cold and miserable, he crept to the opening of Warreen's tent and seeing there was sufficient space for both of them to sleep comfortably, he woke him and said, The storm has killed my fire. I am very wet, and the cold wind has chilled me to the bone. May I sleep in the corner of your tent? Warren blinked his eyes sleepily and answered in a gruff voice, No, I want to place my head in that corner. There isn't any room. With this rude remark, he moved into the corner, but, as he could not occupy the whole space of the tent, another corner became vacant. Murm went away and sat by the wet ashes of his fire, and his thoughts were as miserable as the weather. The fury of the storm increased, and looking anxiously at the rainproof gunya of his friend, he decided to approach Warren again. He entered the shelter, and, touching Warren gently on the shoulder, said, The wind is very cold and as biting as the teeth of the wild dog. The rain is falling heavily and will not cease. I should be very grateful if you would allow me to sleep in that corner. I will not disturb you. Warren raised his head, listened to the moaning of the storm outside, and then replied, I will not have you here. There isn't any room. Go outside and do not keep waking me. But, replied Murm, there is room in that corner. Surely you wouldn't drive me out into the storm to die. Thereupon Warren moved one leg into the corner, and again a space became vacant. Seeing he could no longer hoodwink Murm and hide from him his selfish intentions, he grew very angry and yelled, Get out! Get out! I won't have you in my tent. I don't care where you die. This harsh treatment exasperated Murm, and he left the tent in a terrible rage. Outside the tent, he groped around in the dark until he found a large flat stone. Then he crept silently to the gunya. By the sound of heavy breathing, he knew Warren was asleep. Moving very silently, he entered the tent, and raising the stone high in his arms, dashed it on the head of the sleeper. The terrible blow did not kill Warren, but flattened his forehead. When he had recovered from his pained surprise, he heard the mocking voice of Murm saying, That is your reward for treating a friend so cruelly. You and your children and their children's children will wander through the land with flat foreheads that men may know them for your selfishness. As Warren was no match for his opponent, he did not answer, but nursed his sore head in some very bad thoughts. From that moment, he was always planning revenge for his injury. Some time later, Warren was hunting in the forest, and through the shadow of the trees he saw Murm a short distance ahead. He crept noiselessly towards him, and when Murm was looking for the marks of a possum on the bark of a tree, he threw a spear at him with all his strength. The spear struck Murm at the bottom of the back, and so deeply did it enter that he could not pull it out. While he was struggling with the spear, Warreen walked up to him, 
and in a bantering voice said aha my turn has come at last i have waited long to repay you you will always carry the spear in your back and wander without a home while you live your children will carry the spear and be homeless forever by these tokens men will always remember your attempt to kill me while i slept from that time the kangaroo has had a long tail which makes a low thudding sound as he wanders homeless through the bush and the wombat still has a very flat forehead as an everlasting sign of selfishness end of how the kangaroo got a long tail and the wombat a flat forehead by w e thomas how theseus slays the minotaur by nathaniel hawthorne in the old city of troezen at the foot of a lofty mountain there lived a very long time ago a little boy named theseus his grandfather king pythias was the sovereign of that country and was reckoned a very wise man so that theseus being brought up in the royal palace and being naturally a bright lad could hardly fail of profiting by the old king's instructions his mother's name was ethra as for his father the boy had never seen him but from his earliest remembrance ethra used to go with little theseus into a wood and sit down upon a moss-grown rock which was deeply sunken into the earth here she often talked with her son about his father and said he was called Aegis, and that he was a great king and ruled over Attica, and dwelt at Athens, which was as famous a city as any in the world. Theseus was very fond of hearing about King Aegis, and often asked his good mother Aethra why he did not come and live with them at Troezen. Oh, my dear son, answered Aethra with a sigh, a monarch has his people to take care of. The men and women over whom he rules are in the place of children to him and he can seldom spare time to love his own children as other parents do. Your father will never be able to leave his kingdom for the sake of seeing his little boy. Well, but dear mother, asked the boy, why cannot I go to this famous city of Athens and tell King Aegis that I am his son? That may happen by and by, said Aethra. Be patient and we shall see. You are not yet big and strong enough to set out on such an errand. And how soon shall I be strong enough? Theseus persisted in inquiring. You are but a tiny boy as yet, replied his mother. See if you can lift this rock on which we are sitting. The little fellow had a great opinion of his own strength. So, grasping the rough protuberances of the rock, he tugged and toiled amain and got himself quite out of breath without being able to stir the heavy stone. It seemed to be rooted into the ground. No wonder he could not move it, for it would have taken all the force of a very strong man to lift it out of its earthy bed. His mother stood looking on, with a sad kind of a smile on her lips and in her eyes, to see the zealous yet puny efforts of her little boy. She could not help being sorrowful at finding him already so impatient to begin his adventures in the world. "'You see how it is, my dear Theseus,' said she. "'You must possess far more strength than now, before I can trust you to go to Athens and tell King Aegis that you are his son.' But when you can lift this rock and show me what is hidden beneath it, I promise you my permission to depart. Often and often after this did Theseus ask his mother whether it was yet time for him to go to Athens, and still his mother pointed to the rock and told him that for years to come he could not be strong enough to move it. And again and again the rosy-cheeked and curly-headed boy would tug and strain at the huge mass of stone, striving, child as he was, to do what a giant could hardly have done without taking both of his great hands to the task. Meanwhile, the rock seemed to be sinking farther and farther into the ground. The moss grew over it thicker and thicker, until at last it looked almost like a soft green seat, with only a few gray knobs of granite peeping out. The overhanging trees also shed their brown leaves upon it as often as the autumn came, and at its base grew ferns and wildflowers, some of which crept quite over its surface. To all appearance, the rock was as firmly fastened as any other portion of the earth's substance. But, difficult as the matter looked, Theseus was now growing up to be such a vigorous youth that in his own opinion the time would quickly come when he might hope to get the upper hand of this ponderous lump of stone. "'Mother, I do believe it is started,' cried he, after one of his attempts." The earth around it is certainly a little cracked. No, no, child, his mother hastily answered. It is not possible you can have moved it, such a boy as you still are. Nor would she be convinced, although Theseus showed her the place where he fancied that the stem of a flower had been partly uprooted by the movement of the rock. But Aethra sighed and looked disquieted. 
for no doubt she began to be conscious that her son was no longer a child, and that in a little while hence she must send him forth among the perils and troubles of the world. It was not more than a year afterwards, when they were again sitting on the moss-covered stone. Aethra had once more told him the oft-repeated story of his father, and how gladly he would receive Theseus at his stately palace, and how he would present him to his courtiers and the people, and tell them that here was the heir of his dominions. The eyes of Theseus glowed with enthusiasm, and he would hardly sit still to hear his mother speak. "'Dear Mother Aethra, he exclaimed, "'I never felt half so strong as now. I am no longer a child, nor a boy, nor a mere youth. I feel myself a man. It is now time to make one earnest trial to remove the stone.' "'Oh, my dear Theseus,' replied his mother, "'not yet, not yet.' "'Yes, mother,' said he, resolutely, "'the time has come.' Then Theseus bent himself in good earnest to the task, and strained every sinew with manly strength and resolution. He put his whole brave heart into the effort. He wrestled with the big and sluggish stone, as if it had been a living enemy. He heaved, he lifted, he resolved now to succeed, or else to perish there, and let the rock be his monument forever. Aethra stood gazing at him and clasped her hands, partly with a mother's pride and partly with a mother's sorrow. The great rock stirred. Yes, it was raised slowly from the bedded moss and earth, uprooting the shrubs and flowers along with it, and was turned upon its side. Theseus had conquered. While taking breath, he looked joyfully at his mother, and she smiled upon him through her tears. Yes, Theseus, she said, the time has come, and you must stay no longer at my side. See what King Aegis, your royal father, left for you beneath the stone, when he lifted it in its mighty arms and laid it on the spot whence you have now removed it. Theseus looked and saw that the rock had been placed over another slab of stone containing a cavity within it, so that it somewhat resembled a roughly made chest or coffer, of which the upper mass had served as the lid. Within the cavity lay a sword with a golden hilt and a pair of sandals. That was your father's sword, said Aethra, and those were his sandals. When he went to be king of Athens, he bade me treat you as a child until you should prove yourself a man by lifting this heavy stone. That task being accomplished, you are to put on his sandals in order to follow in your father's footsteps, and to gird on his sword so that you may fight giants and dragons, as King Aegis did in his youth. I will set out for Athens this very day, cried Theseus. But his mother persuaded him to stay a day or two longer, while she got ready some necessary articles for his journey. When his grandfather, the wise King Pythias, heard that Theseus intended to present himself at his father's palace, he earnestly advised him to get on board of a vessel and go by sea, because he might thus arrive within fifteen miles of Athens without either fatigue or danger. The roads are very bad by land, quoth the venerable king, and they are terribly infested with robbers and monsters. A mere lad like Theseus is not fit to be trusted on such a perilous journey all by himself. No, no, let him go by sea. But when Theseus heard of robbers and monsters, he pricked up his ears, and was so much the more eager to take the road along which they were to be met with. On the third day, therefore, he bade a respectful farewell to his grandfather, thanking him for all his kindness, and after affectionately embracing his mother, he set forth, with a good many of her tears glistening on his cheeks, and some, if the truth be told, that had gushed out of his own eyes. But he let the sun and wind dry them, and walked stoutly on, playing with the golden hilt of his sword, and taking very manly strides in his father's sandals. I cannot stop to tell you hardly of any of the adventures that befell Theseus on the road to Athens. It is enough to say that he quite cleared that part of the country of the robbers about whom King Pythias had been so much alarmed. One of these bad people was named Procrustes, and he was indeed a terrible fellow, and had an ugly way of making fun of the poor travelers who happened to fall into his clutches. In his cavern he had a bed, on which, with great pretense of hospitality, he invited his guests to lie down. But if they happened to be shorter than the bed, this wicked villain stretched them out by main force, or, if they were too tall, he lopped off their heads or feet and laughed at what he had done as an excellent joke. Thus, however weary a man might be, he never liked to lie in the bed of Procrustes. Another of these robbers, named Sinus, must likewise have been a very great scoundrel. He was in the habit of flinging his victims off a high cliff into the sea. 
and in order to give him exactly his deserts, Theseus tossed him off the very same place. But, if you will believe me, the sea would not pollute itself by receiving such a bad person into its bosom. Neither would the earth, having once got rid of him, consent to take him back. So that between the cliff and the sea, Sinus stuck fast in the air, which was forced to bear the burden of his naughtiness. After these memorable deeds, Theseus heard of an enormous sow, which ran wild and was the terror of all the farmers round about. And as he did not consider himself above doing any good thing that came in his way, he killed this monstrous creature and gave the carcass to the poor people for bacon. The great sow had been an awful beast while ramping about the woods and fields, but was a pleasant object enough when cut up into joints and smoking on I don't know how many dinner tables. Thus, by the time he reached his journey's end, Theseus had done many valiant feats with his father's golden-hilted sword, and had gained the renown of being one of the bravest young men of the day. His fame traveled faster than he did, and reached Athens before him. As he entered the city, he heard the inhabitants talking at the street corners, and saying that Hercules was brave, and Jason too, and Castor and Pollux likewise, but that Theseus, the son of their own king, would turn out as great a hero as the best of them. Theseus took longer strides on hearing this, and fancied himself sure of magnificent reception at his father's court, since he came thither with fame to blow her trumpet before him, and cry to King Aegis, Behold your son! He little suspected, innocent youth that he was, that here, in this very Athens where his father reigned, a greater danger awaited him than any which he had encountered on the road. Yet this was the truth. You must understand that the father of Theseus, though not very old in years, was almost worn out with the cares of government, and had thus grown aged before his time. His nephews, not expecting him to live a very great while, intended to get all the power of the kingdom into their own hands. But when they heard that Theseus had arrived in Athens, and learned what a gallant young man he was, they saw that he would not be at all the kind of person to let them steal away his father's crown and scepter, which ought to be his own by right of inheritance. Thus these bad-hearted nephews of King Aegis, who were the own cousins of Theseus, at once became his enemies. A still more dangerous enemy was Medea, the wicked enchantress, for she was now the king's wife and wanted to give the kingdom to her son Medus instead of letting it be given to the son of Aethra, whom she hated. It so happened that the king's nephews met Theseus and found out who he was just as he reached the entrance of the royal palace. With all their evil designs against him, they pretended to be their cousin's best friends and expressed great joy at making his acquaintance. They proposed to him that he should come into the king's presence as a stranger in order to try whether Aegis would discover in the young man's features any likeness either to himself or his mother Aethra, and thus recognize him for a son. Theseus consented, for he fancied that his father would know him in a moment by the love that was in his heart. But while he waited at the door, the nephews ran and told King Aegis that a young man had arrived in Athens, who, to their certain knowledge, intended to put him to death and get possession of his royal crown. And he is now waiting for admission to your majesty's presence, added they. Aha, said the old king on hearing this. Why, he must be a very wicked young fellow indeed. Pray, what would you advise me to do with him? In reply to this question, the wicked Medea put in her word. As I have already told you, she was a famous enchantress. According to some stories, she was in the habit of boiling old people in a large cauldron, under the pretense of making them young again. But King Aegis, I suppose, did not fancy such an uncomfortable way of growing young, or perhaps was contented to be old, and therefore would never let himself be popped into the cauldron. If there were time to spare for more important matters, I should be glad to tell you of Medea's fiery chariot, drawn by winged dragons, in which the enchantress used often to take an airing among the clouds. This chariot, in fact, was the vehicle that first brought her to Athens, where she had done nothing but mischief ever since her arrival. But these and many other wonders must be left untold, and it is enough to say that Medea, amongst a thousand other bad things, knew how to prepare a poison that was instantly fatal to whomsoever might so much as touch it with his lips. So when the king asked what he should do with Theseus, this naughty woman had an answer ready at her tongue's end. Leave that to me, please, your majesty, she replied, 
Only admit this evil-minded young man to your presence, treat him civilly, and invite him to drink a goblet of wine. Your majesty is well aware that I sometimes amuse myself with distilling very powerful medicines. Here is one of them in this small phial. As to what it is made of, that is one of my secrets of state. Do but let me put a single drop into the goblet and let the young man taste it, and I shall answer for it, he shall quite lay aside the bad designs with which he comes hither. As she said this, Medea smiled, but for all her smiling face, she meant nothing less than to poison the poor innocent Theseus before his father's eyes. And King Aegis, like most other kings, thought any punishment mild enough for a person who was accused of plotting against his life. He therefore made little or no objection to Medea's scheme, and as soon as the poisonous wine was ready, gave orders that the young stranger should be admitted into his presence. The goblet was set on a table beside the king's throne, and a fly, meant to just sip a little from the brim, immediately tumbled into it dead. Observing this, Medea looked round at the nephews and smiled again. When Theseus was ushered into the royal apartment, the only object that he seemed to behold was the white-bearded old king. There he sat on his magnificent throne, a dazzling crown on his head and a scepter in his hand. His aspect was stately and majestic although his years and infirmities weighed heavily upon him, as if each year were a lump of lead, and each infirmity a ponderous stone, and all were bundled up together and laid upon his weary shoulders. The tears of both joy and sorrow sprang into the young man's eyes, for he thought how sad it was to see his dear father so infirm, and how sweet it would be to support him with his own youthful strength, and to cheer him up with the alacrity of his loving spirit. When a son takes his father into his warm heart, it renews the old man's youth in a better way than by the heat of Medea's magic cauldron. And this was what Theseus resolved to do. He could scarcely wait to see whether King Aegis would recognize him, so eager was he to throw himself into his arms. Advancing to the foot of the throne, he attempted to make a little speech, which he had been thinking about, as he came up the stairs but he was almost choked by a great many tender feelings that gushed out of his heart and swelled into his throat, all struggling to find utterance together. And therefore, unless he could have laid his full, overbrimming heart into the king's hand, poor Theseus knew not what to do or say. The cunning Medea observed what was passing in the young man's mind. She was more wicked at that moment than ever she had been before, for, and it makes me tremble to tell you of it, she did her worst to turn all this unspeakable love with which Theseus was agitated to his own ruin and destruction. Does your majesty see his confusion? She whispered in the king's ear. He is so conscious of guilt that he trembles and cannot speak. The wretch lives too long. Quick, offer him the wine. Now King Aegis had been gazing earnestly at the young stranger as he drew near the throne. There was something, he knew not what, either in his white brow, or in the fine expression of his mouth, or in his beautiful and tender eyes, that made him indistinctly feel as if he had seen this youth before. As if, indeed, he had trotted him on his knee when a baby, and had beheld him growing to be a stalwart man while he himself grew old. But Medea guessed how the king felt, and would not suffer him to yield to these natural sensibilities, although they were the voice of his deepest heart, telling him as plainly as it could speak that here was our dear son, and Aethra's son, coming to claim him for a father. The enchantress again whispered in the king's ear and compelled him by her witchcraft to see everything under a false aspect. He made up his mind, therefore, to let Theseus drink off the poisoned wine. Young man, said he, you are welcome. I am proud to show hospitality to so heroic a youth. Do me the favor to drink the contents of this goblet. It is brimming over, as you see, with delicious wine, such as I bestow only on those who are worthy of it. None is more worthy to quaff it than yourself. So saying, King Aegis took the golden goblet from the table and was about to offer it to Theseus. But partly through his infirmities, and partly because it seemed so sad a thing to take away this young man's life, however wicked he might be, and partly, no doubt, because his heart was wiser than his head, and quaked within him at the thought of what he was going to do. For all these reasons, the king's hand trembled so much that a great deal of the wine slopped over. In order to strengthen his purpose, and fearing lest the whole of the precious poison should be wasted, one of his nephews now whispered to him, Has your majesty any doubt of this stranger's guilt? There is the very sword with which he meant to slay you. How sharp and bright and terrible it is! 
Quick, let him taste the wine, or perhaps he may do the deed even yet. At these words, Aegis drove every thought and feeling out of his breast, except the one idea how justly the young man deserved to be put to death. He sat erect on his throne and held out the goblet of wine with a steady hand and bent on Theseus a frown of kingly severity. For after all, he had too noble a spirit to murder even a treacherous enemy with a deceitful smile upon his face. Drink, said he, in the stern tone with which he was wont to condemn a criminal to be beheaded. You have well deserved of me such wine as this. Theseus held out his hand to take the wine. But before he touched it, King Aegis trembled again. His eyes had fallen on the gold-hilted sword that hung at the young man's side. He drew back the goblet. That sword, he exclaimed, how came you by it? It was my father's sword, replied Theseus with a tremulous voice. These were his sandals. My dear mother, her name is Ethra, told me his story while I was yet a little child. But it is only a month since I grew strong enough to lift the heavy stone and take the sword and sandals from beneath it and come to Athens to seek my father. My son, my son, cried King Aegis, flinging away the fatal goblet and tottering down from the throne to fall into the arms of Theseus. Yes, these are Aethra's eyes. It is my son. I have quite forgotten what became of the king's nephews, but when wicked Medea saw this new turn of affairs, she hurried out of the room and, going to a private chamber, lost no time in setting her enchantments at work. In a few moments, she heard a great noise of hissing snakes outside the chamber window, and behold, there was her fiery chariot and four huge winged serpents wiggling and twisting in the air, flourishing their tails higher than the top of the palace, and all ready to set off on an aerial journey. Medea stayed only long enough to take her son with her, and to steal the crown jewels, together with the king's best robes, and whatever other valuable things she could lay her hands on, and getting into the chariot, she whipped up the snakes and ascended high over the city. The king, hearing the hiss of the serpents, scrambled as fast as he could to the window, and bawled out to the abominable enchantress never to come back. The whole people of Athens, too, who had run out of doors to see this wonderful spectacle, set up a shout of joy at the prospect of getting rid of her. Medea, almost bursting with rage, uttered precisely such a hiss as one of her own snakes, only ten times more venomous and spiteful and glaring fiercely out of the blaze of the chariot, she shook her hands over the multitude below, as if she were scattering a million of curses among them. In so doing, however, she unintentionally let fall about five hundred diamonds of the first water, together with a thousand great pearls and two thousand emeralds, rubies, sapphires, opals, and topazes, to which she had helped herself out of the king's strong box. All these came pelting down like a shower of many-colored hailstones, upon the heads of grown people and children, who forthwith gathered them up and carried them back to the palace. But King Aegis told them that they were welcome to the whole, and to twice as many more if he had them, for the sake of his delight at finding his son and losing the wicked Medea. And indeed, if you had seen how hateful was her last look as the flaming chariot flew upward, you would not have wondered that both king and people should think her departure a good riddance. And now Prince Theseus was taken into great favor by his royal father. The old king was never weary of having him sit beside him on his throne, which was quite wide enough for two, and of hearing him tell about his dear mother and his childhood and his many boyish efforts to lift the ponderous stone. Theseus, however, was much too brave and active a young man to be willing to spend all his time in relating things which had already happened. His ambition was to perform other and more heroic deeds, which should be better worth telling in prose and verse. Nor had he been long in Athens before he caught and chained a terrible mad bull and made a public show of him, greatly to the wonder and admiration of good King Aegis and his subjects. But pretty soon he undertook an affair that made all his foregone adventures seem like mere boy's play. The occasion of it was as follows. One morning when Prince Theseus awoke, he fancied that he must have had a very sorrowful dream and that it was still running in his mind, even now that his eyes were open, for it appeared as if the air was full of a melancholy wail, and when he listened more attentively, he could hear sobs and groans and screams of woe mingled with deep, quiet sighs, which came from the king's palace and from the streets and from the temples and from every habitation in the city. 
and all these mournful noises, issuing out of thousands of separate hearts, united themselves into the one great sound of affliction, which had startled Theseus from slumber. He put on his clothes as quickly as he could, not forgetting his sandals and gold-hilted sword, and hastening to the king, inquired what it all meant. Alas, my son, quoth King Aegis, heaving a long sigh, here is a very lamentable matter in hand. This is the woefulest anniversary in the whole year. It is the day when we annually draw lots to see which of the youths and maidens of Athens shall go to be devoured by the horrible Minotaur. The Minotaur, exclaimed Prince Theseus, and like a brave young prince as he was, he put his hand to the hilt of his sword. What kind of a monster may that be? Is it not possible at the risk of one's life to slay him? But King Aegis shook his venerable head, and to convince Theseus that it was quite a hopeless case, he gave him an explanation of the whole affair. It seems that on the island of Crete there lived a certain dreadful monster called a minotaur, which was shaped partly like a man and partly like a bull, and was altogether such a hideous sort of a creature that it is really disagreeable to think of him. If he were suffered to exist at all, it would have been on some desert island, or in the duskiness of some deep cavern, where nobody would ever be tormented by his abominable aspect. But King Minos, who reigned over Crete, laid out a vast deal of money in building a habitation for the Minotaur, and took great care of his health and comfort, merely for mischief's sake. A few years before this time, there had been a war between the city of Athens and the island of Crete, in which the Athenians were beaten and compelled to beg for peace. No peace could they obtain, however, except on condition that they should send seven young men and seven maidens every year to be devoured by the pet monster of the cruel King Minos. For three years past, this grievous calamity had been born, and the sobs and groans and shrieks with which the city was now filled were caused by the people's woe, because the fatal day had come again, when the fourteen victims were to be chosen by lot, and the old people feared lest their sons or daughters might be taken, and the youths and damsels dreaded lest they themselves might be destined to glut the ravenous maw of that detestable man-brute. But when Theseus heard the story, he straightened himself up, so that he seemed taller than ever before, and as for his face, it was indignant, despiteful, bold, tender, and compassionate, all in one look. Let the people of Athens this year draw lots for only six young men instead of seven, said he. I will myself be the seventh, and let the Minotaur devour me if he can. Oh, my dear son, cried King Aegis, why should you expose yourself to this horrible fate? You are a royal prince, and have a right to hold yourself above the destinies of common men. It is because I am a prince, your son, and the rightful heir of your kingdom, that I freely take upon me the calamity of your subjects, answered Theseus. And you, my father, being king over this people, and answerable to heaven for their welfare, are bound to sacrifice what is dearest to you, rather than that the son or daughter of the poorest citizen should come to any harm. The old king shed tears and besought Theseus not to leave him desolate in his old age more especially as he had but just begun to know the happiness of possessing a good and valiant son. Theseus, however, felt that he was in the right, and therefore would not give up his resolution. But he assured his father that he did not intend to be eaten up unresistingly like a sheep, and that if the minotaur devoured him, it should not be without a battle for his dinner. And finally, since he could not help it, King Aegis consented to let him go. So a vessel was got ready and rigged with black sails and Theseus, with six other young men and seven tender and beautiful damsels, came down to the harbor to embark. A sorrowful multitude accompanied them to the shore. There was the old king, too, leaning on his son's arm, and looking as if his single heart held all the grief of Athens. Just as Prince Theseus was going on board, his father bethought himself of one last word to say. "'My beloved son,' said he, grasping the prince's hand, you observe that the sails of this vessel are black, as indeed they ought to be, since it goes upon a voyage of sorrow and despair. Now, being weighed down with infirmities, I know not whether I can survive till the vessel shall return. But as long as I do live, I shall creep daily to the top of yonder cliff, to watch if there be a sail upon the sea. And, dearest Theseus, if by some happy chance you should escape the jaws of the Minotaur, then tear down those dismal sails and hoist others that shall be as bright as the sunshine. Beholding them on the horizon, myself and all the people will know that you are coming back victorious, and will welcome you with such a festal uproar as Athens never heard before.
Theseus promised that he would do so. Then, going on board, the mariners trimmed the vessel's black sails to the wind, which blew faintly off the shore, being pretty much made up of the sighs that everybody kept pouring forth on this melancholy occasion. But by and by, when they had got fairly out to sea, there came a stiff breeze from the northwest, and drove them along as merrily over the white-capped waves as if they had been going on the most delightful errand imaginable. And although it was a sad business enough, I rather question whether fourteen young people, without any old persons to keep them in order, could continue to spend the whole time of the voyage in being miserable. There had been some few dances upon the undulating deck, I suspect, and some hearty bursts of laughter, and other such unseasonable merriment among the victims, before the high blue mountains of Crete began to show themselves among the far-off clouds. That sight, to be sure, made them all very grave again. Theseus stood among the sailors, gazing eagerly towards the land, although as yet it seemed hardly more substantial than the clouds, amidst which the mountains were looming up. Once or twice he fancied that he saw a glare of some bright object, a long way off, flinging a gleam across the waves. "'Did you see that flash of light?' he inquired of the master of the vessel. "'No, prince, but I've seen it before,' answered the master. "'It came from Talus, I suppose.' As the breeze came fresher just then, the master was busy with trimming his sails and had no more time to answer questions. But while the vessel flew faster and faster towards Crete, Theseus was astonished to behold a human figure, gigantic in size, which appeared to be striding with a measured movement along the margin of the island. It stepped from cliff to cliff, and sometimes from one headland to another, while the sea foamed and thundered on the shore beneath and dashed its jets of spray over the giant's feet. What was still more remarkable, whenever the sun shone on this huge figure, it flickered and glimmered. Its vast countenance, too, had a metallic luster, and threw great flashes of splendor through the air. The folds of its garments, moreover, instead of waving in the wind, fell heavily over its limbs, as if woven of some kind of metal. The nigher the vessel came, the more Theseus wondered what this immense giant could be, and whether it actually had life or no. For, though it walked and made other lifelike motions, there yet was a kind of jerk in its gait, which, together with its brazen aspect, caused the young man to suspect that it was no true giant, but only a wonderful piece of machinery. The figure looked all the more terrible because it carried an enormous brass club on its shoulder. What is this wonder? Theseus asked of the master of the vessel, who was now at leisure to answer him. It is Talus, the man of brass, said the master. And is he a live giant or a brazen image? asked Theseus. That truly, replied the master, is the point which has always perplexed me. Some say, indeed, that this Talus was hammered out for King Minos by Vulcan himself, the skillfulest of all workers in metal. But whoever saw a brazen image that had sense enough to walk round an island three times a day, as this giant walks round the island of Crete, challenging every vessel that comes nigh to the shore? And on the other hand, what living thing, unless his sinews were made of brass, would not be weary of marching 1,800 miles in the 24 hours, as Talus does, without ever sitting down to rest? He is a puzzler, take him how you will. Still, the vessel went bounding onward, and now Theseus could hear the brazen clangor of the giant's footsteps as he trod heavily upon the sea-beaten rocks, some of which were seen to crack and crumble into the foamy waves beneath his weight. As they approached the entrance of the port, the giant straddled clear across it with a foot firmly placed on each headland, and uplifting his club to such a height that its butt end was hidden in a cloud. He stood in that formidable posture with the sun gleaming all over his metallic surface. There seemed nothing else to be expected but that the next moment he would fetch his great club down, slam bang, and smash the vessel into a thousand pieces, without heeding how many innocent people he might destroy. For there is seldom any mercy in a giant, you know, and quite as little in a piece of brass clockwork. But just when Theseus and his companions thought the blow was coming, the brazen lips unclosed themselves and the figure spoke, "'Whence come you, strangers?' And when the ringing voice ceased, there was just such a reverberation as you might have heard within a great church bell for a moment or two after the stroke of the hammer. "'From Athens!' shouted the master in reply. "'On what errand?' thundered the man of brass, as he whirled his club aloft more threateningly than ever, as if he were about to smite them with a thunderstroke right amidships, 
because Athens, so little while ago, had been at war with Crete. We bring the seven youths and the seven maidens, answered the master, to be devoured by the Minotaur. Pass, cried the brazen giant. That one loud word rolled all about the sky, while again there was a booming reverberation within the figure's breast. The vessel glided between the headlands of the port, and the giant resumed his march. In a few moments, this wondrous sentinel was far away, flashing in the distant sunshine, and revolving with immense strides around the island of Crete, as it was his never-ceasing task to do. No sooner had they entered the harbor than a party of the guards of King Minos came down to the waterside and took charge of the fourteen young men and damsels. Surrounded by these armed warriors, Prince Theseus and his companions were led to the king's palace and ushered into his presence. Now Minos was a stern and pitiless king. If the figure that guarded Crete was made of brass, then the monarch who ruled over it might be thought to have a still harder metal in his breast and might have been called a man of iron. He bent his shaggy brows upon the poor Athenian victims. Any other mortal, beholding their fresh and tender beauty and their innocent looks, would have felt himself sitting on thorns until he had made every soul of them happy by bidding them go free as the summer wind. But this immitigable Minos cared only to examine whether they were plump enough to satisfy the Minotaur's appetite. For my part, I wish he himself had been the only victim, and the monster would have found him a pretty tough one. One after another, King Minos called these pale, frightened youths and sobbing maidens to his footstool, gave them each a poke in the ribs with his scepter to try whether they were in good flesh or no, and dismissed them with a nod to his guards. But when his eyes rested on Theseus, the king looked at him more attentively, because his face was calm and brave. "'Young man,' asked he with his stern voice, "'are you not appalled at the certainty of being devoured by this terrible minotaur?' I have offered my life in a good cause, answered Theseus, and therefore I give it freely and gladly. But thou, King Minos, art thou not thyself appalled, who year after year hast perpetrated this dreadful wrong by giving seven innocent youths and as many maidens to be devoured by a monster? Dost thou not tremble, wicked king, to turn thine eyes inward on thine own heart? Sitting there on thy golden throne and in thy robes of majesty, I tell thee to thy face, King Minos, Thou art a more hideous monster than the Minotaur himself. Aha! Do you think me so? asked the king, laughing in his cruel way. Tomorrow at breakfast time you shall have an opportunity of judging which is the greater monster, the Minotaur or the king. Take them away, guards, and let this free-spoken youth be the Minotaur's first morsel. Near the king's throne, though I had no time to tell you so before, stood his daughter Ariadne. She was a beautiful and tender-hearted maiden and looked at these poor doomed captives with very different feelings from those of the iron-breasted King Minos. She really wept indeed at the idea of how much human happiness would be needlessly thrown away by giving so many young people in the first bloom and rose blossom of their lives to be eaten up by a creature who no doubt would have preferred a fat ox or even a large pig to the plumpest of them. And when she beheld the brave, spirited figure of Prince Theseus bearing himself so calmly in his terrible peril, she grew a hundred times more pitiful than before. As the guards were taking him away, she flung herself at the king's feet and besought him to set all the captives free, and especially this one young man. Peace, foolish girl, answered King Minos. What hast thou to do with an affair like this? It is a matter of state policy, and therefore quite beyond thy weak comprehension. Go water thy flowers, and think no more of these Athenian caitiffs, whom the Minotaur shall as certainly eat up for breakfast, as I will eat a partridge for my supper. So saying, the king looked cruel enough to devour Theseus and all the rest of the captives himself, had there been no Minotaur to save him the trouble. As he would not hear another word in their favor, the prisoners were now led away and clapped into a dungeon, where the jailer advised to go to sleep as soon as possible, because the Minotaur was in the habit of calling for breakfast early. The seven maidens and six of the young men soon sobbed themselves to slumber. But Theseus was not like them. He felt conscious that he was wiser and braver and stronger than his companions, and that therefore he had the responsibility of all their lives upon him, and must consider whether there was no way to save them, even in this last extremity. So he kept himself awake and paced to and fro across the gloomy dungeon in which they were shut up. Just before midnight, the door was softly unbarred, and the gentle Ariadne showed herself with a torch in her hand. 
Are you awake, Prince Theseus? she whispered. Yes, answered Theseus. With so little time to live, I do not choose to waste any of it in sleep. Then follow me, said Ariadne, and tread softly. What had become of the jailer and the guards, Theseus never knew. But however that might be, Ariadne opened all the doors and led him forth from the darksome prison into the pleasant moonlight. Theseus, said the maiden, you can now get on board your vessel and sail away for Athens. No, answered the young man, I will never leave Crete unless I can first slay the Minotaur and save my poor companions and deliver Athens from this cruel tribute. I knew this would be your resolution, said Ariadne. Come then with me, brave Theseus. Here's your own sword, which the guards deprived you of. You will need it, and pray heaven you may use it well. Then she led Theseus along by the hand until they came to a dark, shadowy grove, where the moonlight wasted itself on the tops of the trees, without shedding hardly so much as a glimmering beam upon their pathway. After going a good way through this obscurity, they reached a high marble wall, which was overgrown with creeping plants, that made it shaggy with their verdure. This wall seemed to have no door, nor any windows, but rose up lofty and massive and mysterious, and was neither to be clambered over, nor, so far as Theseus could perceive, to be passed through. Nevertheless, Ariadne did but press one of her soft little fingers against a particular block of marble, and although it looked as solid as any other part of the wall, it yielded to her touch, disclosing an entrance just wide enough to admit them. They crept through, and the marble stone swung back into its place. We are now, said Ariadne, in the famous labyrinth which Daedalus built before he made himself a pair of wings and flew away from our island like a bird. That Daedalus was a very cunning workman, but of all his artful contrivances, this labyrinth is the most wondrous. Were we to take but a few steps from the doorway, we might wander about all our lifetime and never find it again. Yet in the very center of this labyrinth is the Minotaur, and Theseus, you must go thither to seek him. But how shall I ever find him, asked Theseus, if the labyrinth so bewilders me as you say it will? Just as he spoke, they heard a rough and very disagreeable roar, which greatly resembled the lowing of a fierce bull, but yet had some sort of sound like the human voice. Theseus even fancied a rude articulation in it, as if the creature that uttered it were trying to shape his hoarse breath into words. It was at some distance, however, and he really could not tell whether it sounded most like a bull's roar or a man's harsh voice. That is the minotaur's noise, whispered Ariadne, closely grasping the hand of Theseus, and pressing one of her own hands to her heart, which was all in a tremble. You must follow that sound through the windings of the labyrinth, and by and by you will find him. Stay, take the end of the silken string, I will hold the other end, and then if you win the victory, it will lead you again to this spot. Farewell, brave Theseus. So the young man took the end of the silken string in his left hand, and his gold-hilted sword, ready drawn from its scabbard, in the other, and trod boldly into the inscrutable labyrinth. How this labyrinth was built is more than I can tell you, but so cunningly contrived a mismaze was never seen in the world, before nor since. There can be nothing else so intricate, unless it were the brain of a man like Daedalus, who planned it, or the heart of any ordinary man, which last, to be sure, is ten times as great a mystery as the labyrinth of Crete. Theseus had not taken five steps before he lost sight of Ariadne, and in five more his head was growing dizzy. But still he went on, now creeping through a low arch, now ascending a flight of steps, now in one crooked passage, and now in another, with here a door opening before him, and there one hanging behind, until it really seemed as if the walls spun round and whirled him round along with them. And all the while, through these hollow avenues, now nearer, now farther off again, resounded the cry of the Minotaur, and the sound was so fierce, so cruel, so ugly, so like a bull's roar, and withal so like a human voice, and yet like neither of them, that the brave heart of Theseus grew sterner and angrier at every step, for he felt it an insult to the moon and sky, and to our affectionate and simple Mother Earth, that such a monster should have the audacity to exist. As he passed onward, the clouds gathered over the moon, and the labyrinth grew so dusky that Theseus could no longer discern the bewilderment through which he was passing. He would have felt quite lost and utterly hopeless of ever again walking in a straight path if every little while he had not been conscious of a gentle twitch at the silken cord. Then he knew that the tender-hearted Ariadne was still holding the other end, 
is fearing for him and hoping for him and giving him just as much of her sympathy as if she were close by his side. Oh, indeed, I can assure you, there was a great deal of human sympathy running along that slender thread of silk. But still he followed the dreadful roar of the Minotaur, which now grew louder and louder, and finally so very loud that Theseus fully expected to come close upon him at every new zigzag and wriggle of the path. And at last in an open space, at the very center of the labyrinth, he did discern the hideous creature. Sure enough, what an ugly monster it was. Only his horned head belonged to a bull. And yet, somehow or other, he looked like a bull all over, preposterously waddling on his hind legs. Or if you happened to view him in another way, he seemed wholly a man, and all the more monstrous for being so. And there he was, the wretched thing, with no society, no companion, no kind of a mate, living only to do mischief, and incapable of knowing what affection means. Theseus hated him, and shuddered at him, and yet could not but be sensible of some sort of pity, and all the more, the uglier and more detestable the creature was. For he kept striding to and fro, in a solitary frenzy of rage, continually emitting a hoarse roar, which was oddly mixed up with half-shaped words. And after listening a while, Theseus understood that the Minotaur was saying to himself how miserable he was, and how hungry, and how much he hated everybody and how he longed to eat up the human race alive. Ah, that bull-headed villain, and oh, my good little people, you will perhaps see one of these days, as I do now, that every human being who suffers anything evil to get into his nature, or to remain there, is a kind of minotaur, an enemy of his fellow creatures, and separated from all good companionship, as this poor monster was. Was Theseus afraid? By no means, my dear auditors. What, a hero like Theseus afraid? Not had the Minotaur had twenty bullheads instead of one. Bold as he was, however, I rather fancy that it strengthened his valiant heart, just at this crisis, to feel a tremulous twitch at the silken cord, which he was still holding in his left hand. It was as if Ariadne were giving him all her might and courage, and much as he already had, and as little as she had to give, it made his own seem twice as much. And to confess the honest truth, he needed the whole. For now, the Minotaur, turning suddenly about, caught sight of Theseus and instantly lowered his horribly sharp horns, exactly as a mad bull does when he means to rush against an enemy. At the same time, he belched forth a tremendous roar, in which there was something like the words of human language, but all disjointed and shaken to pieces by passing through the gullet of the miserably enraged brute. Theseus could only guess what the creature intended to say and that rather by his gestures than his words, for the minotaur's horns were sharper than his wits, and of a great deal more service to him than his tongue. But probably this was the sense of what he uttered. Oh, wretch of a human being, I'll stick my horns through you, and toss you fifty feet high, and eat you up the moment you come down. Come on, then, and try it, was all that Theseus deigned to reply, for he was far too magnanimous to assault his enemy with insolent language. Without more words on either side, there ensued the most awful fight between Theseus and the Minotaur that ever happened beneath the sun or moon. I really know not how it might have turned out if the monster in his first headlong rush against Theseus had not missed him by a hair's breadth and broken one of his horns short off against the stone wall. On this mishap, he bellowed so intolerably that a part of the labyrinth tumbled down and all the inhabitants of Crete mistook the noise for an uncommonly heavy thunderstorm. Smarting with the pain, he galloped around the open space in so ridiculous a way that Theseus laughed at it long afterwards, though not precisely at the moment. After this, the two antagonists stood valiantly up to one another and fought sword to horn for a long while. At last, the Minotaur made a run at Theseus, grazed his left side with his horn and flung him down, and thinking that he had stabbed him to the heart, he cut a great caper in the air, opened his bull mouth from ear to ear, and prepared to snap his head off. But Theseus by this time had leaped up and caught the monster off guard. Fetching a sword stroke at him with all his force, he hit him fair upon the neck and made his bull head skip six yards from his human body, which fell down flat upon the ground. So now the battle was ended. Immediately the moon shone out as brightly as if all the troubles of the world and all the wickedness and the ugliness that infest human life were past and gone forever. And Theseus, as he leaned on his sword, taking breath, felt another twitch of the silken cord. 
for all through the terrible encounter he had held it fast in his left hand. Eager to let Ariadne know of his success, he followed the guidance of the thread and soon found himself at the entrance of the labyrinth. Thou hast slain the monster, cried Ariadne, clasping her hands. Thanks to thee, dear Ariadne, answered Theseus, I return victorious. Then, said Ariadne, we must quickly summon thy friends and get them and thyself on board the vessel before dawn. If morning finds thee here, my father will avenge the Minotaur. To make my story short, the poor captives were awakened, and hardly knowing whether it was not a joyful dream, were told what Theseus had done, and that they must set sail for Athens before daybreak. Hastening down to the vessel, they all clambered on board, except Prince Theseus, who lingered behind them on the strand, holding Ariadne's hand clasped in his own. Dear maiden, he said, thou wilt surely go with us. Thou art too gentle and sweet a child for such an iron-hearted father as King Minos. He cares no more for thee than a granite rock cares for the little flower that grows in one of its crevices. But my father, King Aegis, and my dear mother Aethra, and all the fathers and mothers in Athens, and all the sons and daughters too, will love and honor thee as their benefactress. Come with us then, for King Minos will be very angry when he knows what thou hast done. Now some low-minded people, who pretend to tell the story of Theseus and Ariadne, have the face to say that this royal and honorable maiden did really flee away under cover of the night with the young stranger whose life she had preserved. They say, too, that Prince Theseus, who could have died sooner than wrong the meanest creature in the world, ungratefully deserted Ariadne on a solitary island where the vessel touched on its voyage to Athens. But had the noble Theseus heard these falsehoods, he would have served their slanderous authors as he served the Minotaur. Here is what Ariadne answered when the brave prince of Athens besought her to accompany him. No, Theseus, the maiden said, pressing his hand, and then drawing back a step or two, I cannot go with you. My father is old and has nobody but myself to love him. Hard as you think his heart is, it would break to lose me. At first, King Minos will be angry, but he will soon forgive his only child, and by and by he will rejoice, I know, that no more youths and maidens must come from Athens to be devoured by the Minotaur. I've saved you, Theseus, as much for my father's sake as for your own. Farewell, heaven bless you. All this was so true and so maidenlike, and was spoken with so sweet a dignity, that Theseus would have blushed to urge her any longer. Nothing remained for him, therefore, but to bid Ariadne an affectionate farewell, and to go on board the vessel and set sail. In a few moments, the white foam was boiling up before their prow, as Prince Theseus and his companions sailed out of the harbor with a whistling breeze behind them. Talus, the brazen giant, on his never-ceasing sentinel's march, happened to be approaching that part of the coast, and they saw him by the glimmering of the moonbeams on his polished surface, while he was yet a great way off. As the figure moved like clockwork, however, and could neither hasten his enormous strides nor retard them, he arrived at the port when they were just beyond the reach of his club. Nevertheless, straddling from headland to headland as his custom was, Talus attempted to strike a blow at the vessel and overreaching himself, tumbled at full length into the sea, which splashed high over his gigantic shape as when an iceberg turns a somerset. There he lies still, and whoever desires to enrich himself by means of brass had better go thither with a diving bell and fish up talus. On the homeward voyage, the fourteen youths and damsels were in excellent spirits, as you will easily suppose. They spent most of their time in dancing, unless when the sidelong breeze made the deck slope too much. In due season they came within sight of the coast of Attica, which was their native country. But here, I am grieved to tell you, happened a sad misfortune. You will remember what Theseus unfortunately forgot, that his father King Aegis had enjoined it upon him to hoist sunshiny sails instead of black ones, in case he should overcome the Minotaur and return victorious. In the joy of their success, however, and amidst the sports, dancing, and other merriment with which these young folks wore away the time, they never once thought whether their sails were black, white, or rainbow-colored, and indeed left it entirely to the mariners whether they had any sails at all. Thus the vessel returned like a raven, with the same sable wings that had wafted her away. But poor King Aegis, day after day, infirm as he was, had clambered to the summit of a cliff that overhung the sea, and there sat watching for Prince Theseus homeward bound, and no sooner did he behold the fatal blackness of the sails then he concluded that his dear son, whom he loved so much and felt so proud of, had been eaten by the Minotaur. He could not bear the thought of living any longer, 
So, first flinging his crown and scepter into the sea, useless baubles that they were to him now, King Aegis merely stooped forward and fell headlong over the cliff and was drowned, poor soul, in the waves that foamed at its base. This was melancholy news for Prince Theseus, who, when he stepped ashore, found himself king of all the country, whether he would or no, and such a turn of fortune was enough to make any young man feel very much out of spirits. However, he sent for his dear mother to Athens, and by taking her advice in matters of state, became a very excellent monarch and was greatly beloved by his people. End of How Theseus Slays the Minotaur by Nathaniel Hawthorne Ivan Zarevich, The Firebird, and The Grey Wolf by Jeremiah Curtin In a certain kingdom, in a certain land, lived Tsar Vizlav Andronovich. He had three sons, Dmitri Tsarevich, Vasily Tsarevich, and Ivan Tsarevich. Tsar Vizlav had a garden so rich that in no land was there better. In the garden grew many precious trees, with fruit and without fruit. Tsar Vizlav had one favorite apple tree, and on that tree grew apples all golden. The firebird used to fly to the garden of Tsar Vizlav. She had wings of gold and eyes like the crystals of the east, and she used to fly to that garden every night, sit on the favorite apple tree, pluck from it golden apples, and then fly away. The Tsar grieved greatly over that apple tree, because the firebird plucked from it many apples. Therefore he called his three sons and said, My dear children, whichever one of you can catch the firebird in my garden and take her alive, to him I will give during my life one half of the kingdom, and at my death I will give it all. Then the sons cried out in one voice, Gracious Sovereign, our father, we will try with great pleasure to take the firebird alive. The first night, Dmitri Tsarevich went to watch in the garden, and sat under the apple tree from which the firebird had been plucking the apples. He fell asleep, and did not hear the firebird when she came, nor when she plucked many apples. Next morning, Tsar Vizlav called his son Dmitri Tsarevich, and asked, Well, my dear son, hast thou seen the firebird? No, gracious sovereign, my father, she came not last night. The next night, Vasily Zarevich went to the garden to watch the firebird. He sat under the same apple tree, and in a couple of hours fell asleep so soundly that he did not hear the firebird when she came, nor when she plucked apples. Next morning, Tsar Vizlav called him and asked, Well, my dear son, hast thou seen the firebird? Gracious sovereign, my father, she came not last night. The third night, Ivan Zarevich went to watch in the garden and sat under the same apple tree. He sat an hour, a second, and a third. All at once the whole garden was lighted up as if by many fires. The firebird flew hither, perched on the apple tree, and began to pluck apples. Ivan stole up to her so warily that he caught her tail, but he could not hold the bird. She tore off, flew away, and there remained in the hand of Ivan Tsarevich but one feather of the tail, which he held very firmly. Next morning, the moment Tsar Vizlav woke from his sleep, Ivan Tsarevich went to him and gave him the feather of the firebird. The Tsar was greatly delighted that his youngest son had been able to get even one feather of the firebird. This feather was so wonderful and bright that when carried into a dark chamber, it shone as if a great multitude of tapers were lighted in that place. Tsar Vizlav put the feather in his cabinet as a thing to be guarded forever. From that time forth, the firebird flew to the garden no more. Tsar Vizlav again called his sons and said, My dear children, I give you my blessing. Set out, find the firebird, and bring her to me alive. And what I promised at first, he will surely receive who brings me the bird. Dmitri and Vasily Tsarevich began to cherish hatred against their youngest brother because he had pulled the feather from the tail of the firebird. They took their father's blessing, and both went to find the firebird. Ivan Tsarevich, too, began to beg his father's blessing. The Tsar said to him, My dear son, my darling child, thou art still young, unused to such a long and difficult journey. Why shouldst thou part from me? Thy brothers have gone, 
Now, if thou goest too, and all three of you fail to return for a long time, I am old and walk under God. And if during your absence the Lord takes my life, who would rule in my place? There might be a rebellion too, or disagreement among our people. There would be no one to stop it. Or, if an enemy should invade our land, there would be no one to command our men. But no matter how the Tsar tried to detain Ivan Tsarevich, he could not avoid letting him go at his urgent prayer. Ivan Tsarevich took a blessing of his father, chose a horse, and rode away. He rode on, not knowing himself whither. Riding by a path by the road, whether it was near or far, high or low, a tale is soon told, but a deed's not soon done. At last he came to the green meadows. In the open field a pillar stands, and on the pillar these words are written, Whoever goes from this pillar straight forward will be hungry and cold. Whoever goes to the right hand will be healthy and well, but his horse will be dead. Whoever goes to the left hand will be killed himself, but his horse will be living and well. Ivan read the inscription, and went to the right hand, holding in his mind that though his horse might be killed, he would remain alive, and might in time get another horse. He rode one day, a second, and a third. All at once an enormous gray wolf came out against him and said, Oh, is that thou tender youth Ivan Zarevich? Thou hast read on the pillar that thy horse will be dead. Why hast thou come hither then? The wolf said these words, tore Ivan Zarevich's horse in two, and went to one side. Ivan grieved greatly for his horse. He cried bitterly and went forward on foot. He walked all day and was unspeakably tired. He was going to sit down and rest, when all at once the gray wolf caught up with him and said, I am sorry for thee, Ivan Zarevich. Thou art tired from walking. I am sorry that I ate thy good steed. Well, sit on me, the old wolf, and tell me whither to bear thee, and why. Ivan Zarevich told the gray wolf whither he had to go, and the gray wolf shot ahead with him swifter than a horse. After a time, just at nightfall, he brought Ivan Zarevich to a stone wall not very high, halted, and said, Now, Ivan Zarevich, come down from the gray wolf, climb over that stone wall, on the other side is a garden, and in the garden the firebird in a golden cage. Take the firebird, but touch not the cage. If thou takest the cage, thou'lt not escape. They will seize thee straight away. Ivan Tsarevich climbed over the wall into the garden, saw the firebird in the golden cage, and was greatly tempted by the cage. He took the bird out and was going back, but changed his mind and thought, why have I taken the bird without a cage? Where can I put her? He returned, but had barely taken down the cage when there was a hammering and thundering throughout the whole garden, for there were wires attached to the cage. The watchman woke up at that moment, ran to the garden, caught Ivan Tsarevich with the firebird, and took him to the Tsar, who was called Dolmat. Tsar Dolmat was terribly enraged at Ivan, and shouted at him in loud, angry tones, is it not a shame for thee, young man, to steal? But who art thou? Of what land? Of what father a son? And how do they call thee by name? Ivan Zarevich replied, I am from Vizla's kingdom, the son of Tsar Vizlav Andronovich, and they call me Ivan Zarevich. Thy firebird used to fly to our garden each night and pluck golden apples from my father's favorite apple tree and destroyed almost the whole tree. Therefore, my father has sent me to find the firebird and bring it to him. O oh, youthful young man, Ivan Zarevich, said Tsar Dolmat, is it fitting to do as thou hast done? Thou shouldest come to me, and I would have given thee the firebird with honor. But now will it be well for thee when I send to all lands to declare how dishonorably thou hast acted in my kingdom? Listen, however, Ivan Zarevich, if thou wilt do me a service, if thou wilt go beyond the thrice ninth land to the thirteenth kingdom, and get for me from Tsar Afrin the golden-maned steed, I will forgive thy offense, and give thee the firebird with great honor. If not, I will publish in all the kingdoms 
that thou art a dishonorable thief. Ivan Zarevich went away from Tsar Dolmat in great grief, promising to obtain for him the golden-maned steed. He came to the Grey Wolf and told him all that Tsar Dolmat had said. Oh, is that thou, youthful young man, Ivan Zarevich? Why didst thou disobey my words and take the golden cage? I have offended in thy sight, said Ivan to the Grey Wolf. Well, let that go. Sit on me, and I will take thee wherever thou wilt. Ivan Tsarevich sat on the back of the gray wolf. The wolf was as swift as an arrow, and ran, whether it was long or short, till he came at last to the kingdom of Tsar Afrin in the night time. Coming to the white-walled stables, the gray wolf said, Go, Ivan Tsarevich, into these white-walled stables, the grooms on guard are sleeping soundly, and take the golden-maned steed. On the wall hangs a golden bridle, but take not the bridle, or it will go ill with thee. Ivan Zarevich entered the white-walled stables, took the steed, and was coming back. But he saw on the walls the golden bridle, and was so tempted that he took it from the nail. That moment there went a thunder and a noise throughout the stables, because strings were tied to the bridle. The grooms on guard woke up that moment, rushed in, seized Ivan Zarevich, and took him to Tsar Afrin. Tsar Afrin began to question him. O youthful young man, tell me from what land thou art, of what father a son, and how do they call thee by name? To this Ivan Tsarevich replied, I am from Vizlav's kingdom, the son of Tsar Vizlav, and they call me Ivan Tsarevich. O youthful young man, Ivan Tsarevich, said Tsar Afrin, was that which thou hast done the deed of an honorable knight? I would have given thee the golden maned steed with honor. Will it be well for thee when I send to all lands a declaration of how dishonorably thou hast acted in my kingdom? Hear me, however, Ivan Zarevich. If thou wilt do me a service and go beyond the thrice ninth land to the thirteenth kingdom and bring to me Princess Yelena the Beautiful, with whom I am in love, heart and soul, for a long time, but whom I cannot obtain, I will pardon thy offense and give thee the golden maned steed with honor. And if thou wilt not do me this service, I will declare in all lands that thou art a dishonorable thief. Ivan Zarevich promised Tsar Afrin to bring Yelena the Beautiful, left the palace, and fell to crying bitterly. He came to the gray wolf and told him all that had happened. O oh, Ivan Zarevich, thou youthful young man, said the gray wolf, why didst thou disobey me and take the golden bridle? I have offended in thy sight, said Ivan Zarevich. Well, let that go, replied the wolf. Sit on me, I will take thee wherever need be. Ivan Zarevich sat on the back of the gray wolf, who ran as swiftly as an arrow flies, and he ran in such fashion as to be told in a tale no long time. And at last he came to the kingdom of Yelena the Beautiful. Coming to the golden fence which surrounded her wonderful garden, the wolf said, Now, Ivan Zarevich, come down from me, and go back by the same road along which we came, and wait in the field, under the green oak. Ivan Zarevich went where he was commanded, but the gray wolf sat near the golden fence, and waited till Yelena the Beautiful should walk in the garden. Toward evening, when the sun was sinking low in the west, therefore it was not very warm in the air, Princess Yelena went to walk in the garden, with her maidens and court ladies. When she entered the garden and approached the place where the gray wolf was sitting behind the fence, he jumped out suddenly, caught the princess, sprang back again, and bore her away with all his power and might. He came to the green oak in the open field where Ivan Zarevich was waiting, and said, Ivan Zarevich, sit on me quickly. Ivan sat on him, and the gray wolf bore them both along swiftly to the kingdom of Tsar Ephron. The nurses and maidens and all the court ladies who had been walking in the garden with the princess Yelena the Beautiful ran straight away to the palace and sent pursuers to overtake the gray wolf. But no matter how they ran, they could not overtake him and turned back. Ivan Tsarevich, while sitting on the gray wolf with Princess Yelena the Beautiful, came to love her with his heart, and she, Ivan Tsarevich. And when the gray wolf arrived at the kingdom of Tsar Afrin, Ivan Tsarevich had to take Yelena the Beautiful to the palace and give her to Tsar Afrin. He grew very sad, 
and began to weep tearfully. "'What art thou weeping for, Ivan Tsarevich? asked the grey wolf. "'My friend, why should I, good youth, not weep? I have formed a heartfelt love for Yelena the Beautiful, and now I must give her to Tsar Afrin for the golden mane steed, and if I yield her not, then Tsar Afrin will dishonor me in all lands.' I have served thee much, Ivan Tsarevich, said the grey wolf, and I will do yet this service. Listen to me. I will turn myself into a princess, Yelena the Beautiful. Do thou give me to Tsar Afrin, and take from him the golden mane steed. He will think me the real princess. And when thou art sitting on the steed, and riding far away, I will beg of Tsar Afrin permission to walk in the open field. When he lets me go with the maidens and nurses and all the court ladies, and I am with them in the open field, remember me, and I will come to thee. The grey wolf spoke these words, struck the damp earth, and became a princess, Yelena the Beautiful, so that it was not possible in any way to know that the wolf was not the princess. Ivan Tsarevich told Yelena the Beautiful to wait outside the town, and took the grey wolf to the palace of Tsar Afrin. When Ivan Tsarevich came with a pretended Yelena the Beautiful, Tsar Afrin was greatly delighted in his heart that he had received a treasure which he had long desired. He took the false maiden and gave Ivan Tsarevich the golden-maned steed. Ivan Tsarevich mounted the steed and rode out of the town, seated Yelena the Beautiful with him, and rode on, holding his way toward the kingdom of Tsar Dolmat. The Grey Wolf lived with Tsar Afrin a day, a second and a third, instead of Yelena the Beautiful. On the fourth day, he went to Tsar Efren, begging to go out in the open field to walk, to drive away cruel grief and sorrow. Then Tsar Efren said, O oh, my beautiful Princess Yelena, I will do everything for thee. I will let thee go out to the open field to walk. And straightway he commanded the nurses, the maidens, and all the court ladies to go to the open field and walk with the beautiful princess. Ivan Zarevich was riding along his road and path with Yelena the Beautiful, talking with her, and he had forgotten about the Grey Wolf, but afterward remembered, Oh, where is my Grey Wolf? All at once, from wherever he came, the wolf stood before Ivan and said, Ivan Zarevich, sit on me, the Grey Wolf, and let the beautiful princess ride on the golden-maned steed. Ivan Zarevich sat on the Grey Wolf, and they went toward the kingdom of Tsar Dolmat. Whether they journeyed long or short, when they had come to the kingdom, they stopped about three versts from the capital town, and Ivan Tsarevich began to implore, Listen to me, Grey Wolf, my dear friend. Thou hast shown me many a service. Show me the last one now, and the last one is this. Couldst thou not turn to a golden maned steed instead of this one? For I do not like to part with this horse. Suddenly the Grey Wolf struck the damp earth, and became a golden mane steed. Ivan Tsarevich, leaving Princess Yelena in the green meadow, sat on the gray wolf and went to the palace of Tsar Dolmat. The moment he came, Tsar Dolmat saw that Ivan Tsarevich was riding on the golden mane steed, and he rejoiced greatly. Straight away he went out of the palace, met the Tsarevich in the broad court, kissed him, took him by the right hand, and led him into the white stone chambers. Tsar Dolmat, on the occasion of such joy, gave orders for a feast, and they sat at the oaken table at the spread cloth. They ate, they drank, they amused themselves, and rejoiced exactly two days, and on the third day Tsar Dolmat gave Ivan Tsarevich the firebird together with a golden cage. Ivan took the firebird, went outside the town, sat on the golden mane steed together with Yelena the Beautiful, and went toward his own native place, towards the kingdom of Tsar Vislav. Tsar Dolmat, the next day, thought to take a ride through the open field on his golden mane steed. He ordered them to saddle him. He sat on the horse and rode to the open field. The moment he urged the horse, the horse threw Tsar Dolmat off his back, became the gray wolf as before, ran off, and came up with Ivan Tsarevich. Ivan Tsarevich, he said, sit on me, the gray wolf, and let Yelena the Beautiful ride on the golden mane steed. Ivan sat on the gray wolf, and they went their way. When the gray wolf had brought Ivan to the place where he had torn his horse, he stopped and said, I have served thee sufficiently, with faith and truth. 
On this spot I tore thy horse in two. To this spot I have brought thee. Come down from me, the grey wolf. Thou hast a golden mane steed. Sit on him, and go wherever thou hast need. I am no longer thy servant. The grey wolf said these words and ran to one side. Ivan wept bitterly for the grey wolf, and went on with the beautiful princess. Whether he rode long or short with the beautiful princess, when he was within twenty versts of his own kingdom, he stopped, dismounted, and he and the beautiful princess rested from the heat of the sun under a tree. He tied the golden maned steed to the same tree and put the cage at the firebird by his side. Lying on the soft grass, they talked pleasantly and fell soundly asleep. At that time, the brothers of Ivan Zarevich, Dmitri and Vasily Zarevich, after traveling through many lands without finding the firebird, were on their way home with empty hands and came unexpectedly upon their brother with a beautiful princess. Seeing the golden maned steed and the firebird in the cage, they were greatly tempted and thought of killing their brother Ivan. Dmitri took his own sword out of the scabbard, stabbed Ivan Zarevich, and cut him to pieces. Then he roused the beautiful princess and asked, Beautiful maiden, of what land art thou? Of what father a daughter, and how do they call thee by name? The beautiful princess, seeing Ivan Zarevich dead, was terribly frightened. She began to shed bitter tears, and in her tears she said, I am Princess Yelena the Beautiful. Ivan Zarevich, whom ye have given to a cruel death, got me. If ye were good knights, ye would have gone with him into the open field and conquered him there. But ye killed him when asleep. And what fame will ye receive for yourselves? A sleeping man is the same as a dead one. Then Dmitri Tsarevich put his sword to the heart of Yelena the Beautiful and said, Hear me, Yelena the Beautiful. Thou art now in our hands. We will take thee to our father, Tsar Vislav. Thou wilt tell him that we got thee and the firebird and the golden maned steed. If not, we will give thee to death this minute. The princess, afraid of death, promised them, and swore by everything sacred that she would speak as commanded. Then they began to cast lots, who should have Yelena the Beautiful, and who the golden maned steed. And the lot fell that the princess should go to Vasily, and the golden maned steed to Dmitri. Then Vasily Tsarevich took the princess and placed her on his horse. Dmitri sat on the golden maned steed, and took the firebird to give to their father, Tsar Vislav, and they went on their way. Ivan Tsarevich lay dead on that spot exactly thirty days. Then the grey wolf ran up, knew Ivan by his odor, wanted to aid him to bring him to life, but knew not how. Just then the grey wolf saw a raven with two young ones who were flying above the body and wanted to eat the flesh of Ivan Tsarevich. The wolf hid behind a bush, and when the young ravens had come down and were ready to eat the body, he sprang out, caught one, and was going to tear it in two. Then the raven came down, sat a little way from the grey wolf, and said, O oh, grey wolf, touch not my young child, it has done nothing to thee. Listen to me, raven, said the grey wolf, I will not touch thy child, I will let it go unharmed and well, if thou wilt do me a service. Fly beyond the thrice ninth land to the thirteenth kingdom, and bring me the water of death and the water of life. I will do that, but touch not my son. Having said these words, the raven flew away, and soon disappeared from sight. On the third day the raven returned, bringing two vials, in one the water of life, in the other the water of death, and gave them both to the grey wolf. The wolf took the vials, tore the young raven in two, sprinkled it with the water of death. The little raven grew together. He sprinkled it with the water of life, and the raven sprang up and flew away. The grey wolf sprinkled Ivan Tsarevich with the water of death. His body grew together. He sprinkled it with the water of life. Ivan Tsarevich stood up and exclaimed, Oh, how long I have slept! Thou wouldst have slept forever had it not been for me. Thy brothers cut thee to pieces and carried off Princess Yelena with the golden maned steed and the firebird. Now hurry with all speed to thine own country. Vasily Tsarevich will marry thy bride today. To reach home quickly, sit on me. I will bear thee. 
Ivan sat on the gray wolf. The wolf ran with him to the kingdom of Tsar Vizlav, and whether it was long or short, he ran to the edge of the town. Ivan sprang from the gray wolf, walked into the town, and found that his brother Vasily had married Yelena the Beautiful, had returned with her from the ceremony, and was sitting with her at the feast. Ivan Tsarevich entered the palace, and when Yelena the Beautiful saw him, she sprang up from the table, kissed him, and cried out, This is my dear bridegroom, Ivan Tsarevich, and not that scoundrel at the table. Then Tsar Vizlav rose from his place and asked the meaning of these words. Yelena the Beautiful told the whole truth, told how Ivan Tsarevich had won her, the golden maned steed, and the firebird, how his elder brother had killed him while asleep, and how they had terrified her into saying that they had won everything. Tsar Vizlav was terribly enraged at Dmitri and Vasily, and cast them into prison. But Ivan Tsarevich married Yelena the Beautiful, and lived with her in harmony and love, so that one of them could not exist a single minute without the other. End of Ivan Tsarevich, The Firebird, and The Grey Wolf by Jeremiah Curtin The Lorelei Retold by Marie H. Freire and Charles M. Stebbins Count Ludwig was the only son of the Prince Palatine. He lived with his father in the castle at Stalek. The young Count had heard many marvelous tales of the beautiful Lorelei, and he determined to go in search of her. One evening he stole from his father's castle to sail down the Rhine. He hoped to catch a glimpse of the siren Lorelei. The stars were twinkling softly overhead, and the bark slowly drifted down the river. Darker and darker grew the waters as the bed of the Rhine grew narrower. But the young Count did not notice this. His eyes were fixed on the rocks far above, where he hoped to see the beautiful nymph. Suddenly he saw a shimmer of white drapery and golden hair. At the same time he heard the faint, sweet sound of an alluring song. As he drew nearer, the melody became more distinct. The moonbeams fell upon the maiden and seemed to make her even more beautiful. She bent over the rocky ledge and beckoned him to draw nearer. The count and boatman were spellbound by the vision above them, and they paid no heed to the vessel. Suddenly the boat struck against the rocks and went to pieces. The men struggled against the swift current, and all escaped except the young count. Him the Lorelei took down to her magic palace below the river to be her lover forever. Many different stories about the young count's fate were related by the men who escaped. The Prince Palatine was deeply grieved over his only son's death. He blamed the beautiful Lorelei and longed for revenge. Finally, he sent one of his greatest warriors. You are to capture this wicked creature who has caused so much woe, he said. Take a band of armed men and post them at once all around the rock so that the nymph cannot escape. The great warrior did as he was commanded. At the head of a band of armed men, he climbed noiselessly up the moonlit cliff and presented himself before the charming Lorelei. There she sat, as usual, combing her golden hair and crooning her matchless song. The men hemmed her in on all sides. They left no mode of escape except by the steep descent to the river. We command you to surrender, said the captain of the band. The nymph made no reply, but gracefully waved her white hands. The grim old warriors suddenly felt as if rooted to the spot. They could neither move nor speak. There they stood motionless with dilated eyes fixed upon the Lorelei. They saw her remove all her jewels and drop them one by one into the Rhine beneath her feet. Then she whirled about in a mystic spell, chanting her magic tunes. They could understand nothing of it except now and then a word about white-maned steeds and pearl-shell chariots. When the song and dance were ended, the waters of the Rhine began to seethe and bubble. Higher and higher they rose until they reached the top of the cliff. The petrified warriors felt the cold tide surge about their feet. Suddenly they saw a great white-crested wave rolling rapidly toward them. 
in its green depths they beheld a chariot drawn by white-maned steeds into this car the laurel i sprang and quickly vanished over the edge of the cliff into the river in a few moments the angry waters had sunk to their usual level the brave warriors discovered that they could move once more they rubbed their eyes and looked about them no trace of the sudden rise except the water drops along the face of the cliff could be seen these shone in the moonlight like diamonds the lorelei has never since then appeared on the cliff but boatmen have often heard the faint sweet echo of her alluring song wafted toward them on the summer breeze at midnight it is said that she remains in her beautiful palace and gardens below the green rhine enjoying the companionship of her earthly lover end of the lorelei retold by marie h ferry and charles m stebbins maui lifting the sky by william drake westervelt maui's home was for a long time enveloped by darkness the heavens had fallen down or rather had not been separated from the earth according to some legends the skies pressed so closely and so heavily upon the earth that when the plants began to grow all the leaves were necessarily flat according to other legends the plants had to push up the clouds a little and thus caused the leaves to flatten out into larger surface so that they could better drive the skies back and hold them in place thus the leaves became flat at first and have so remained through all the days of mankind the plants lifted the sky inch by inch until men were able to crawl about between the heavens and the earth and thus pass from place to place and visit one another after a long time according to the hawaiian legends a man supposed to be maui came to a woman and said give me a drink from your gourd calabash and i will push the heavens higher the woman handed the gourd to him when he had taken a deep draught he braced himself against the clouds and lifted them to the height of the trees again he hoisted the sky and carried it to the tops of the mountains then with great exertion he thrust it upwards once more and pressed it to the place it now occupies nevertheless dark clouds many times hang low along the eastern slope of maui's great mountain haleakala and descend in heavy rains upon the hill kauiki but they dare not stay lest maui the strong come and hurl them so far away that they cannot come back again a man who had been watching the process of lifting the sky ridiculed maui for attempting such a difficult task when the clouds rested on the tops of the mountains maui turned to punish his critic the man had fled to the other side of the island maui rapidly pursued and finally caught him on the sea coast not many miles north of the town now known as lahaina after a brief struggle the man was changed according to the story into a great black rock which can be seen by any traveller who desires to localize the legends of hawaii in samoa te'ite the latter part of the full name of maui ki'i ki'i is used as the name of the one who braced his feet against the rocks and pushed the sky up the footprints some six feet long are said to be shown by the natives another samoan story is almost like the hawaiian legend the heavens had fallen people crawled but the leaves pushed up a little but the sky was uneven men tried to walk but hit their heads and in this confined space it was very hot a woman rewarded a man who lifted the sky to its proper place by giving him a drink of water from her coconut shell a number of small groups of islands in the pacific have legends of their skies being lifted but they attribute the labor to the great eels and serpents of the sea one of the elise group new island says that as the serpent began to lift the sky the people clapped their hands and shouted lift up high higher but the body of the serpent finally broke into pieces which became islands and the blood sprinkled its drops on the sky and became stars one of the samoan legends says that a plant called daiga which had one large umbrella-like leaf pushed up the sky and gave it its shape 
The Vatupu, or Tracy Islanders, said at one time the sky and rocks were united. Then steam or clouds of smoke rose from the rocks, and pouring out in volumes, forced the sky away from the earth. Man appeared in these clouds of steam or smoke. Perspiration burst forth as this man forced his way through the heated atmosphere. From this perspiration, woman was formed. Then were born three sons, two of whom pushed up the sky. One in the north pushed as far as his arms would reach. The one in the south was short and climbed a hill, pushing as he went up until the sky was in its proper place. The Gilbert Islanders say the sky was pushed up by men with long poles. The ancient New Zealanders understood incantations by which they could draw up or discover. They found a land where the sky and the earth were united. They prayed over their stone axe and cut the sky and land apart. Hau Hau Tu was the name of the great stone axe by which the sinews of the great heaven above were severed, and Rangi Sky was separated from Papa Earth. The New Zealand Maoris were accustomed to say that at first the sky rested close upon the earth, and therefore there was utter darkness for ages. Then the six sons of heaven and earth, born during this period of darkness, felt the need of light and discussed the necessity of separating their parents, the sky from the earth, and decided to attempt the work. Rongo, Hawaiian god Lono, the father of food plants, attempted to lift the sky, but could not tear it from the earth. Then Tangaroa, Kanaloa, the father of fish and reptiles, failed. Haumia Tiki Tiki, who was the father of wild food plants, could not raise the clouds. Then Tu, Hawaiian Ku, the father of fierce men, struggled in vain. Batane, Hawaiian Kane, the father of giant forests, pushed and lifted until he thrust the sky far up above him. Then they discovered their descendants, the multitude of human beings who had been living on the earth, concealed and crushed by the clouds. Afterwards, the last son, Tawiri, father of storms, was angry and waged war against his brothers. He hid in the sheltered hollows of the great skies. There he begot his vast brood of winds and storms with which he finally drove all his brothers and their descendants into hiding places on land and sea. The New Zealanders mention the names of the canoes in which their ancestors fled from the old home Hawaiiki. Two, father of fierce men, and his descendants, however, conquered wind and storm and have ever since held supremacy. The New Zealand legends also say that heaven and earth have never lost their love for each other. The warm sighs of earth ever ascend from the wooded mountains and valleys, and men call them mists. The sky also lets fall frequent tears, which men term dewdrops. The Manihiki islanders say that Maui desired to separate the sky from the earth. His father, Ru, was the supporter of the heavens. Maui persuaded him to assist in lifting the burden. Maui went to the north and crept into a place where, lying prostrate under the sky, he could brace himself against it and push with great power. In the same way, Ru went to the south and braced himself against the southern skies. Then they made the signal, and both pressed with their backs against the solid blue mass. It gave way before the great strength of the father and son. Then they lifted again, bracing themselves with hands and knees against the earth. They crowded it and bent it upward. They were able to stand with the sky resting on their shoulders. They heaved against the bending mass, and it receded rapidly. They quickly put the palms of their hands under it, then the tips of their fingers, and it retreated farther and farther. At last, drawing themselves out to gigantic proportions, they pushed the entire heavens up to the very lofty position which they have ever since occupied. But Maui and Ru had not worked perfectly together. 
therefore the sky was twisted, and its surface was very irregular. They determined to smooth the sky before they finished their task, so they took large stone adzes and chipped off the rough protuberances and ridges, until by and by the great arch was cut out and smoothed off. They then took finer tools and chipped and polished until the sky became the beautifully finished blue dome which now bends around the earth. The Hervey Island myth, as related by W. W. Gill, states that Ru, the father of Maui, came from Avaiki, Havaiki, the underworld or abode of the spirits of the dead. He found men crowded down by the sky, which was a mass of solid blue stone. He was very sorry when he saw the condition of the inhabitants of the earth and planned to raise the sky a little. So he planted stakes of different kinds of trees. These were strong enough to hold the skies so far above the earth that men could stand erect and walk about without inconvenience. This was celebrated in one of the Hervey Island songs. Force up the heavens, O Ru, and let the space be clear. For this helpful deed, Ru received the name the Supporter of the Heavens. He was rather proud of his achievement and was gratified because of the praise received. So he came sometimes and looked at the stakes and the beautiful blue sky resting on them. Maui, the son, came along and ridiculed his father for thinking so much of his work. Maui is not represented in the legends as possessing a great deal of love and reverence for his relatives, provided his affection interfered with his mischief, so it was not at all strange that he laughed at his father. Ru became angry and said to Maui, Who told youngsters to talk? Take care of yourself, or I will hurl you out of existence. Maui dared him to try it. Ru quickly seized him and threw him to a great height, but Maui changed himself to a bird and sank back to earth unharmed. Then he changed himself back into the form of a man, and making himself very large, ran and thrust his head between the old man's legs. He pried and lifted until Ru and the sky around him began to give. Another lift, and he hurled them both to such a height that the sky could not come back. Ru himself was entangled among the stars. His head and shoulders stuck fast, and he could not free himself. How he struggled until the skies shook while Maui went away. Maui was proud of his achievement in having moved the skies so far away. In this self-rejoicing, he quickly forgot his father. Ru died after a time. His body rotted away, and his bones of vast proportions came tumbling down from time to time, and were shivered on the earth into countless fragments. These shattered bones of Rue were scattered over every hill and valley of one of the islands to the very edge of the sea. Thus the natives of the Hervey Islands account for the many pieces of porous lava and the small pieces of pumice stone found occasionally in their islands. The bones were very light and greatly resembled fragments of real bone. If the fragments were large enough, they were sometimes taken and worshipped as gods. One of these pieces, of extraordinary size, was given to Mr. Gill when the natives were bringing in a large collection of idols. This one was known as the Light Stone and was worshipped as the god of the wind and the waves. Upon occasions of a hurricane, incantations and offerings of food would be made to it. Thus, according to different Polynesian legends, Maui raised the sky and made the earth inhabitable for his fellow men. End of Maui Lifting the Sky by William Drake Westervelt My Lord Bag of Rice From Japanese Fairy Tales by Ye Theodora Ozaki Long, long ago there lived in Japan a brave warrior known to all as Tawara Toda, or My Lord Bag of Rice. His true name was Fujiwara Hidesado, and there is a very interesting story of how he came to change his name. One day he sallied forth in search of adventures, for he had the nature of a warrior and could not bear to be idle. So he buckled on his two swords, took his huge bow, much taller than himself, 
in hand and slinging his quiver on his back started out. He had not gone far when he came to the bridge of Saitano Karashi, spanning one end of the beautiful Lake Biwa. No sooner had he set foot on the bridge than he saw lying right across his path a huge serpent dragon. Its body was so big that it looked like the trunk of a large pine tree, and it took up the whole width of the bridge. One of its huge claws rested on the parapet of one side of the bridge, while its tail lay right against the other. The monster seemed to be asleep, and as it breathed, fire and smoke came out of its nostrils. At first, Hidesato could not help feeling alarmed at the sight of this horrible reptile lying in his path, for he must either turn back or walk right over its body. He was a brave man, however, and, putting aside all fear, went forward dauntlessly. Crunch! Crunch! He stepped now on the dragon's body, now between its coils, and without even one glance backward he went on his way. He had only gone a few steps when he heard someone calling him from behind. On turning back, he was much surprised to see that the monster dragon had entirely disappeared, and in its place was a strange-looking man, who was bowing most ceremoniously to the ground. His red hair streamed over his shoulders, and was surmounted by a crown in the shape of a dragon's head, and his sea-green dress was patterned with shells. Hidesato knew at once that this was no ordinary mortal, and he wondered much at the strange occurrence. Where had the dragon gone in such a short space of time? Or had it transformed itself into this man? And what did the whole thing mean? While these thoughts passed through his mind, he had come up and now addressed him. Was it you that called me just now? Yes, it was I, answered the man, and I have an earnest request to make to you. Do you think you can grant it to me? If it is in my power to do so, I will, answered Hidesato. But first, tell me who you are. I am the Dragon King of the Lake, and my home is in these waters just under this bridge. And what do you have to ask of me? said Hidesato. I want you to kill my mortal enemy, the centipede, who lives on the mountain beyond. And the Dragon King pointed to a high peak on the opposite shore of the lake. I have lived now for many years in this lake, and I have a large family of children and grandchildren. For some time past we have lived in terror, for a monster centipede has discovered our home, and night after night it comes and carries off one of my family. I am powerless to save them. If it goes on much longer like this, not only shall I lose all of my children, but I myself must fall victim to the monster. I am, therefore, very unhappy, and in my extremity I determined to ask the help of a human being. For many days, with this intention, I have waited on that bridge in the shape of a horrible serpent dragon that you saw, in the hope that some strong, brave man would come along. But all who came this way as soon as they saw me, were terrified and ran away as fast as they could. You are the first man I have found able to look at me without fear, so I knew at once that you were the man of great courage. I beg you to have pity upon me. Will you not help me and kill my enemy, the centipede? Hidesato felt very sorry for the Dragon King on hearing his story and readily promised to do what he could to help him. The warrior asked where the centipede lived, so that he might attack the creature at once. The dragon king replied that its home was on the mountain of Mikami, but that, as it came every night at a certain hour to the palace of the lake, it would be better to wait till then. So Hidesato was conducted to the palace of the dragon king under the bridge. Strange to say, as he followed his host downwards, the waters parted to let them pass, 
and his clothes did not even feel damp as he passed through the flood. Never had Hirasato seen anything so beautiful as this palace built of white marble beneath the lake. He had often heard of the sea king's palace at the bottom of the sea, where all the servants and retainers were saltwater fishes. But here was a magnificent building in the heart of Lake Biwa. The dainty goldfishes, red carp, and silvery trout waited upon the dragon king and his guest. Hidesato was astonished at the feast that was spread for him. The dishes were crystallized lotus leaves and flowers, and the chopsticks were of the rarest ebony. As soon as they sat down, the sliding doors opened, and ten lovely goldfish dancers came out, and behind them followed ten red carp musicians with the koto and samisen. Thus the hours flew by till midnight, and the beautiful music and dancing had banished all thoughts of the centipede. The dragon king was about to pledge the warrior in a fresh cup of wine when the palace was suddenly shaken by a tramp, tramp as if a mighty army had begun to march not far away. Hidesato and his hosts both rose to their feet and rushed to the balcony, and the warrior saw on the opposite mountain two great balls of glowing fire coming nearer and nearer. The dragon king stood by the warrior's side, trembling with fear. The centipede! The centipede! Those two balls of fire are its eyes! It is coming for its prey. Now is the time to kill it. Itasato looked where his host pointed, and in the dim light of the starlit evening, behind the two balls of fire, he saw the long body of an enormous centipede winding round the mountains, and the light in its hundred feet glowed like so many distant lanterns moving slowly towards the shore. Itasato showed not the least sign of fear. He tried to calm the dragon king. Don't be afraid. I shall surely kill the centipede. Just bring me my bow and arrows. The dragon king did as he was bid, and noticed that he had only three arrows left in his quiver. He took the bow, and fitting an arrow to the notch, took careful aim and let fly. The arrow hit the centipede right in the middle of its head but instead of penetrating, it glanced off harmless and fell to the ground. Nothing daunted, Hidesato took another arrow, fitted it to the notch of the bow, and let fly. Again the arrow hit the mark. It struck the centipede right in the middle of its head, only to glance off and fall to the ground. The centipede was invulnerable to weapons. When the Dragon King saw that even this brave warrior's arrows were powerless to kill the centipede, he lost heart and began to tremble with fear. The warrior saw that he had now only one arrow left in his quiver, and if this one failed, he could not kill the centipede. He looked across the waters and would soon come down to the lake. Nearer and nearer gleamed fireballs of eyes, and the light of its hundred feet began to throw reflections in the still waters of the lake. Then suddenly, the warrior remembered that he had heard that human saliva was deadly to centipedes. But this was no ordinary centipede. It was so monstrous that even to think of such a creature made one creep with horror. Hidesato determined to try his last chance. So, taking his last arrow and first putting the end of it in his mouth, he fitted the notch to his bow, took careful aim once more, and let fly. This time, the arrow again hit the centipede right in the middle of its head, but instead of glancing off harmlessly as before, it struck home to the creature's brain. Then, with a convulsive shudder, the serpentine body stopped moving, and the fiery light of its great eyes and hundred feet darkened to a dull glare, like the sunset of a stormy day, and then went out in blackness. A great darkness now overspread the heavens. The thunder rolled and the lightning flashed, and the wind roared in fury, and it seemed as if the world were coming to an end. The dragon king and his children and retainers all crouched in different parts of the palace, frightened to death 
for the building was shaken to its foundation. At last, the dreadful night was over. Day dawned beautiful and clear. The centipede was gone from the mountain. Then Hidesato called to the dragon king to come out with him on the balcony, where the centipede was dead and he had nothing more to fear. Then all the inhabitants of the palace came out with joy, and Hidesato pointed to the lake. There lay the body of the dead centipede, floating on the water, which was dyed red with its blood. The gratitude of the dragon king knew no bounds. The whole family came and bowed down before the warrior, calling him their preserver and the bravest warrior in all Japan. Another feast was prepared, more sumptuous than the first. All kinds of fish, prepared in every imaginable way, raw, stewed, boiled, and roasted, served on coral trays and crystal dishes were put before him, and the wine was the best that Hidesato had ever tasted in his life. To add to the beauty of everything, the sun shone brightly, the lake glittered like a liquid diamond, and the palace was a thousand times more beautiful by day than by night. His host tried to persuade the warrior to stay a few days, but Hidesato insisted on going home, saying that he now had finished what he had come to do and must return. The Dragon King and his family were all very sorry to have him leave so soon, but since he would go, they begged him to accept a few small presents, so they said, in token of their gratitude to him for delivering them forever from their horrible enemy, the Centipede. As the warrior stood in the porch taking leave, a train of fish was suddenly transformed into a retinue of men, all wearing ceremonial robes, and dragon's crowns on their heads to show that they were servants of the great dragon king. The presents that they carried were as follows. First, a large bronze bell. Second, a bag of rice. Third, a roll of silk. Fourth, a cooking pot. Fifth, a bell. Itisato did not want to accept all these presents, but as the dragon king insisted, he could not well refuse. The Dragon King himself accompanied the warrior as far as the bridge and then took leave of him with many bows and good wishes, leaving the procession of servants to accompany Hidesato to his house with the presents. The warrior's household and servants had been very much concerned when they found that he did not return the night before, but they finally concluded that he had been kept by the violent storm and had taken shelter somewhere. When the servants on the watch for his return caught sight of him, they called to everyone that he was approaching, and the whole household turned out to meet him, wondering much what the retinue of men bearing presents and banners that followed him could mean. As soon as the Dragon King's retainers had put down the presents, they vanished, and Hidesato told all that had happened to him. The presents which he had received from the grateful Dragon King were found to be of magic power. The bell only was ordinary, and as Hidesato had no use for it, he presented it to the temple nearby, where it was hung up to boom out the hour of the day over the surrounding neighborhood. The single bag of rice, however, much was taken from it day after day for the meals of the night, and his whole family never grew less. The supply in the bag was inexhaustible, The roll of silk, too, never grew shorter, though time after time long pieces were cut off to make the warrior a new suit of clothes to go to court in the new year. The cooking pot was wonderful, too. No matter what was put into it, it cooked deliciously whatever it was wanted without any firing. Truly a very economical saucepan. The fame of Hidesato's fortune spread far and wide, and there was no need for him to spend money on rice or silk or firing. He became very rich and prosperous and was henceforth known as My Lord Bag of Rice. End of My Lord Bag of Rice From Japanese Fairy Tales by Ye Theodora Ozaki Myths of the Cherokee by James Mooney 1902. Section 5. 
Chapter 5 The Daughter of the Sun From Myths of the Cherokee The sun lived on the other side of the sky vault, but her daughter lived in the middle of the sky, directly above the earth. And every day, as the sun was climbing along the sky arch to the west, she used to stop at her daughter's house for dinner. Now the sun hated the people on the earth, because they could never look straight at her without screwing up their faces. She said to her brother the moon, My grandchildren are ugly. They grin all over their faces when they look at me. But the moon said, I like my younger brothers. I think they are very handsome, because they always smiled pleasantly when they saw him in the sky at night, for his rays were milder. The sun was jealous and planned to kill all the people, so every day when she got near her daughter's house, she sent down such sultry rays that there was a great fever and people died by the hundreds until everyone had lost some friend and there was a fear that no one would be left. They went for help to the little men, who said the only way to save themselves was to kill the sun. The little men made medicine and changed two men to snakes, the spreading adder and the copperhead and sent them to watch near the door of the daughter of the sun, to bite the old sun when she came the next day. They went together, and hid near the house until the sun came. But when the spreading adder was about to spring, the bright light blinded him, and he could only spit out yellow slime, as he does to this day when he tries to bite. She called him a nasty thing, and went by into the house, and the copperhead crawled off without trying to do anything. So the people still died from the heat, and they went to the little men a second time for help. The little men made medicine again, and changed one man into the great Uptana, and another to the rattlesnake, and sent them to watch near the house and kill the old son when she came for dinner. They made the Uptana very large, with horns on his head, and everyone thought he would be sure to do the work. But the rattlesnake was so quick and eager that he got ahead and coiled up just outside the house, and when the son's daughter opened the door to look out for her mother, he sprang up and bit her and she fell dead in the doorway. He forgot to wait for the old son, but went back to the people, and the Uptena was so very angry that he went back too. Since then we pray to the rattlesnake and do not kill him, because he is kind and never tries to bite if we do not disturb him. The Uctana grew angrier all the time and very dangerous, so that if he even looked at a man, that man's family would die. After a long time, the people held a council and decided that he was too dangerous to be with them. So they sent him up to Galunati, and there he is now. The spreading adder, the copperhead, the rattlesnake, and the Uctana were all men. When the son found her daughter dead, she went into the house and grieved, and the people did not die any more. But now the world was dark all the time, because the sun would not come out. They went again to the little men, and these told them that if they wanted the sun to come out again, they must bring back her daughter from Suskanayi, the ghost country, in Usunhiye, the darkening land in the west. They chose seven men to go, and gave each a sour wood rod a handbreadth long. The little men told them they must take a box with them, and when they got to Siskunie, they would find all the ghosts at a dance. They must stand outside the circle, and when the young woman passed in the dance, they must strike her with the rods and she would fall to the ground. Then they must put her into the box and bring her back to her mother, but they must be very sure not to open the box, even a little way, until they were home again. They took the rods in a box and traveled seven days to the west until they came to the darkening land. There were a great many people there, and they were having a dance just as if they were at home in the settlements. The young woman was in the outside circle, and as she swung around to where the seven men were standing, one struck her with his rod and she turned her head and saw him. As she came around the second time, another touched her with his rod, and then another, and another until at the seventh round she fell out of the ring, and they put her into the box and closed the lid fast. The other ghosts never seemed to notice what had happened. They took up the box and started home toward the east. In a little while the girl came to life again and begged to be let out of the box, but they made no answer and went on. Soon she called again and said she was hungry, but still they made no answer and went on. 
After another while, she spoke again and called for a drink and pleaded so that it was very hard to listen to her. But the men who carried the box said nothing and still went on. When at last they were very near home, she called again and begged them to raise the lid just a little because she was smothering. They were afraid she was really dying now, so they lifted the lid a little to give her air. But as they did so, there was a fluttering sound inside, and something flew past them into the thicket, and they heard a redbird cry, Quish! 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 in the bushes. They shut down the lid and went on again to the settlements, but when they got there and opened the box, it was empty. So we know the red bird is the daughter of the sun, and if the men had kept the box closed, as the little men told them to do, they would have brought her home safely, and we could bring back our friends also from the ghost country. But now when they die, we can never bring them back. The sun had been glad when they started to the ghost country, but when they came back without her daughter, she grieved and cried, My daughter, my daughter and wept until her tears made a flood upon the earth, and the people were afraid the world would be drowned. They held another council, and sent their handsomest young men and women to amuse her so that she would stop crying. They danced before the sun and sang their best songs, but for a long time she kept her face covered and paid no attention, until at last the drummer suddenly changed the song, when she lifted up her face and was so pleased at the sight that she forgot her grief and smiled. End of Section 5, Chapter 5, The Daughter of the Sun, from Myths of the Cherokee, by James Mooney, 1902. Paul Bunyan Tales, by Charles E. Brown. The mythical hero of the Lumberjacks is Paul Bunyan, and tales of his great strength and wonderful exploits are, or formerly were, told by the fires of the bunkhouses and the logging camps from Maine to Oregon, Washington, and California. All lumberjacks believe, or pretend to believe, that he really lived, and was the pioneer in the lumber country. Some of the older men even claim to have known him, or members of his crew. In Wisconsin, the location of one of his camps is stated to have been 45 miles west of Rhinelander. Paul Bunyan Bunyan was a powerful giant, seven feet tall and with a stride of seven feet. He was famous throughout the lumbering districts for his great physical strength. So great was his lung capacity that he called the men to dinner by blowing through a hollow tree. When he spoke, limbs sometimes fell from trees. To keep his pipe filled required the entire time of a swamper with a scoop shovel. He could not write and ordered the supplies for his camp by drawing pictures of what he wanted. Once he ordered grindstones and got cheeses. He forgot to draw the holes. He kept the time of his men by cutting notches in a piece of wood. No undertaking was too great for Paul. Lumberjacks say that he is the man who logged the timber off North Dakota. He also scooped out the hole for Lake Superior. This he used for a reservoir as he was needing water to ice his logging roads. The Mississippi River was caused by the overturning of a water tank when his ox slipped. His logging crew his logging crew on the Big Onion River, the winter of the blue snow, in about 1862 or... 1865 was so large that the men were divided into three gangs. One of these was always going to work, a second was at work, and a third was always returning to camp from work. This kept the cooks busy, for when they had finished preparing breakfast to one crew, they had to prepare dinner for another and supper for a third. To sharpen their axes, the men sometimes rolled boulders down steep hillsides and, running after them, ground the blades against the revolving stones. Jim Liverpool was a great jumper. Planting his feet on the bank of a river, he could jump across it in three jumps. Black Dan McDonald, Tom McCann, Dutch Jake, Red Murphy, Curly Charlie, Yellowhead, and Patsy Ward were other well-known members of his daredevil crew. One of the men had two sets of teeth which he could saw through anything. One night, while walking in his sleep, he encountered a grindstone, and before he awoke, chewed it up. The Camp the cook shanty was so large that it took half a day to walk around its outside. Three forties had to be cleared each week to keep up a fire in the big cook stove. An entire cord of wood was needed to start a blaze. The loaves of bread were gigantic. When the men had eaten the insides, the crusts were used for bunks. Some say bunk houses. One day, Joe Mufferon, the cook, put a loaf in the oven and started around to the other side to remove it. 
but before he got there it had burned to a crisp. Before he began to make pancakes, he strapped hams on the feet of his two colored assistants and had them skate over the top of the stove to grease it. His eyesight being poor, one day he mixed some blasting powder with the batter. It blew up, and the colored assistants went through the roof and never did come back. That was the winter of the black snow. Seven men were kept busy with wheelbarrows hauling prune stones away from the camp. The chipmunks ate these and grew as big as tigers. Paul had much trouble with his cooks. He was always having to hire new ones. One got lost between the potato bin and the flour bin and nearly starved to death before he was found. The horn which Paul or the cook used to call the men to dinner was so large that it once blew down ten acres of pine. Next time the cook blew it straight up and that caused a cyclone. The dining room was so large that when a man told a yarn at one end it grew so big by the time it reached the other that it had to be shoveled out. Donuts, sinkers, were carried from the kitchen by two men on poles which they carried on their shoulders. Sometimes they were rolled down the length of the tables, the men catching them as they went by. Big Ole, the blacksmith, cut the holes in them with a punch and a sledge. The Blue Ox Bunyan was assisted in his lumbering by a huge blue ox, Babe, of whom he was very fond. This ox had the strength of nine horses, and it weighed ten thousand pounds. It measured seven axe handles between the eyes. Its horns were of immense size. The men tied a line to their tips and hung clothing on it to dry. The original color of the animal was pure white. One winter it snowed blue snow for seven days, and the ox lying down in it all winter was dyed blue. With the ox, Paul dragged a whole house up a hill, then he dragged the cellar up after it. When he wanted to peel a log, he hitched the ox to one end and himself took hold of the bark at the other. The ox pulled and out came the log, as clean as a whistle. Babe sometimes got into mischief. Once he broke loose at night and ate up two hundred feet of tow line. Sometimes he slipped in behind the crew, drank the water in the river, and left the drive high and dry. Some of the lakes in Wisconsin and Minnesota are in holes made by his feet. Bunyan had many other oxen besides Babe. When strung out in a line, if each took the tail of the other in his mouth, they would stretch halfway around the state. Their yokes piled up, made one hundred cords of wood. One day he drove his oxen through a hollow log which had fallen across a great ravine. When they came through, he counted them and saw that several were missing. These he found had strayed into a hollow limb. Big Ole Big Ole was Paul's blacksmith at the Big Onion Camp. He was a very powerful man, and when he struck his anvil, the rings of the metal could be heard in the next county. He alone could shoe Babe, the ox, single-handed. Once he carried two of his shoes for a mile and sunk knee-deep in the solid rock at every step. Every time the ox was shot, a new iron mine had to be opened up. The Pyramid Forty at Round River, in section 37, there was a forty shaped like a pyramid, with a heavy growth of timber on all of its sides. To see to the top took a week. It was as far as twenty men could see. Bunyan and his crew labored all one winter, the winter of the blue snow, to clear it. From it, they cut one hundred million feet of timber. Some of the men got one short leg from working all winter on one side of the slope. The Round River Drive the crew rolled the logs cut on the pyramid, forty, down to the bank and in the spring started them down the river. They drove for two weeks or more, hoping to reach a mill town where they could dispose of them. It was not until they had passed their camp several times that they realized that the river was round and had no outlet. Someone recognized the pyramid. Forty Jones Exploit One day Forty Jones, the straw boss, saw some deer tracks near the river. He watched for them, and at night when they came to drink, removed the key log from a pile of logs forty feet high, which rolled downhill and killed two hundred of the herd. The camp then had enough venison to last all winter. The Buckskin Harness The barn boss made a harness of the hides for the blue ox. Later, Pink Eye Martin was hauling in logs for firewood. When he started with his load, it began to rain and the buckskin to stretch, and when he reached camp, Babe was beside him, but the load was still down in the woods. He tied the ox and went in to dinner. When he was eating, the sun came out very hot, dried the harness, and hauled the logs to camp. Bean Soup Lake Near the Round River, there was a hot spring. One day, the tote team, bringing up a mammoth load of beans, overturned near the spring, and the beans fell into it. 
the teamster expected to be discharged for losing the beans joe the cook took some salt pepper and pork and threw them in among the beans so the camp had good soup all winter the cook's assistants however were angry because each day they had to tramp three miles to bring soup to the camp another version of this tale says that the tote teamster was driving across a frozen lake with a load of peas when the ice suddenly thawed and the ox was drowned bunyan dammed the lake fired the slashings on shore and then opening the dam sluiced down the river to his men pea soup with an oxtail flavor when the men were working at a distance from the camp the cook got the soup to them by freezing it onto sticks and pieces of rope wild animals haunting the woods about the logging camps were numerous fabulous animals some were very wild and fierce and others harmless there was a bird which laid square eggs so that they would not roll downhill the upland trout built its nest in tall trees and was very difficult to catch the side hill dodger had two short legs on the uphill side the pinnacle grouse had only one wing this enabled it to fly only in one direction about the top of a conical hill snow snakes were most active in the winter time they made victims of men who wandered in the woods after dark the rumptafusel and the hodag were beasts of great ferocity End of Paul Bunyan Tales by Charles E. Brown The Popol Vuh, The First Book by Lewis Spence Over a universe wrapped in the gloom of a dense and primeval night passed the god Hurrican, the mighty wind. He called out, Earth, and the solid land appeared. The chief gods took counsel. They were Hurrican, Gugamots, the serpent covered with green feathers, and Supayakuk and Zumukane, the mother and father gods. As the result of their deliberations, animals were created, but as yet man was not. To supply the deficiency, the divine beings resolved to create mannequins carved out of wood, but these soon incurred the displeasure of the gods, who, irritated by their lack of reverence, resolved to destroy them. Then, by the will of Hurricane, the heart of heaven, the waters were swollen, and a great flood came upon the mannequins of wood. They were drowned, and a thick rosin fell from heaven. The bird Sikatkavach tore out their eyes. The bird Camelots cut off their heads. The bird Kotzbalam devoured their flesh. The bird Tekumbalam broke their bones and sinews and ground them into powder. Because they had not thought on Hurrican, therefore the face of the earth grew dark, and a pouring rain commenced, raining by day and by night. Then all sorts of beings, great and small, gathered together to abuse the men to their faces. The very household utensils and animals jeered at them, their millstones, their plates, their cups, their dogs, their hens. Said the dogs and hens, very badly have you treated us, and you have bitten us. Now we bite you in turn. Said the millstones, Matates, Very much were we tormented by you, and daily, daily, night and day, it was squeak, screech, screech, for your sake. Now you shall feel our strength, and we will grind your flesh and make meal of your bodies. And the dogs upbraided the mannequins because they had not been fed, and tore the unhappy images with their teeth. And the cups and dishes said, Pain and misery you gave us, smoking our tops and sides, cooking us over the fire, burning and hurting us as if we had no feeling. Now it is your turn, and you shall burn. Then ran the mannequins hither and thither in despair. They climbed to the roofs of the houses, but the houses crumbled under their feet. They tried to mount to the tops of the trees, but the trees hurled them from them. They sought refuge in the caverns, but the caverns closed before them. Thus was accomplished the ruin of this race, destined to be overthrown. And it is said that their posterity are the little monkeys who live in the woods. The Myth of Vukub Kekix After this catastrophe, ere yet the earth was quite recovered from the wrath of the gods, there existed a man full of pride, whose name was Vukub Kekix. The name signifies seven times the color of fire, or 
very brilliant, and was justified by the fact that its owner's eyes were of silver, his teeth of emerald, and other parts of his anatomy of precious metals. In his own opinion, Vukub Kekix's existence rendered unnecessary that of the sun and the moon, and this egoism so disgusted the gods that they resolved upon his overthrow. His two sons, Sipakna and Kebrekin, earth heaper and earthquake, were daily employed, the one in heaping up mountains and the other in demolishing them, and these also incurred the wrath of the immortals. Shortly after the decision of the deities, the twin hero gods Hun Apu and Sabanke came to earth with the intention of chastising the arrogance of Vukub Kekix and his progeny. Now, Vukub Kekix had a great tree of the variety known in Central America as Nans or Tapal, bearing a fruit round, yellow, and aromatic, and upon this fruit he depended for his daily sustenance. One day, on going to partake of it for his morning meal, he mounted to its summit in order to espy the choicest fruits, when, to his great indignation, he discovered that Hunahu and Blanque had been before him, and had almost denuded the tree of its produce. The hero gods, who lay concealed within the foliage, now added injury to theft by hurling at Vukukekix a dart from the blowpipe, which had the effect of precipitating him from the summit of the tree to the earth. He arose in great wrath, bleeding profusely from a severe wound in the jaw. Hun Apu then threw himself upon Vukub Kekix, who in terrible anger seized the god by the arm and wrenched it from the body. He then proceeded to his dwelling, where he was met and anxiously interrogated by his spouse Chimalmat. Tortured by the pain in his teeth and jaw, he, in an access of spite, hung Han Apu's arm above a blazing fire, and then threw himself down to bemoan his injuries, consoling himself, however, with the idea that he had adequately avenged himself upon the interlopers who had dared to disturb his peace. But Han Apu and Xablanque were in no mind that he should escape so easily, and the recovery of Han Apu's arm must be made at all hazards. With this end in view, they consulted two venerable beings in whom we readily recognize the father-mother divinities, Supayakok and Samukain, disguised for the nonce as sorcerers. These personages accompanied Han Apu and Sablanke to the abode of Vukub Kekix, whom they found in a state of intense agony. The ancients persuaded him to be operated upon in order to relieve his sufferings, and for his glittering teeth they substituted grains of maize, Next they removed his eyes of emerald, upon which his death speedily followed, as did that of his wife Chimalmat. Hanapu's arm was recovered, reaffixed to his shoulder, and all ended satisfactorily for the hero gods. But their mission was not yet complete. The sons of Vukub Kekix, Zipakna and Kebrekin, remained to be accounted for. Zipakna consented, at the entreaty of four hundred youths, incited by the hero gods, to assist them in transporting a huge tree which was destined for the roof tree of a house they were building. Whilst assisting them, he was beguiled by them into entering a great ditch which they had dug for the purpose of destroying him, and when once he descended was overwhelmed by tree trunks by his treacherous acquaintances, who imagined him to be slain. But he took refuge in a side tunnel of the excavation, cut off his hair and nails for the ants to carry up to his enemies as a sign of his death, waited until the youths had become intoxicated with pulque because of joy at his supposed demise, and then, emerging from the pit, shook the house that the youths had built over his body about their heads so that all were destroyed in its ruins. But Han Apu and Sablanke were grieved that the four hundred had perished, and laid a more efficacious trap for Zabakna. The mountain-bearer, carrying the mountains by night, sought his sustenance by day by the shore of the river, where he lived upon fish and crabs. The hero-gods constructed an artificial crab, which they placed in a cavern at the bottom of a deep ravine. The hungry titan descended to the cave which he entered on all fours, 
but a neighboring mountain had been undermined by the divine brothers, and its bulk was cast upon him. Thus, at the foot of the Mount Maven perished the proud mountain-maker, whose corpse was turned into stone by the catastrophe. Of the family of boasters, only Cabrakin remained. Discovered by the hero-gods at his favorite pastime of overturning the hills, they enticed him in an easterly direction, challenging him to overthrow a particularly high mountain. On the way, they shot a bird with their blowpipes and poisoned it with earth. This they gave to Cabrakin to eat. After partaking of the poisoned fare, his strength deserted him, and failing to move the mountain, he was bound and buried by the victorious hero gods. End of the Popova Book One by Lewis Spence